Welcome to the Endurance Studio Podcast. I'm your host, Dylan Turner. I'm an avid ultra-endurance cyclist, bikepacker, and runner, and I'm on a journey to learn and share everything I can about how people can push beyond their limits. This podcast will explore all aspects of endurance through conversations with people I find unique and interesting. There's always an amazing story of accomplishment and failure, and always something to learn. run this podcast from an off-grid mobile studio I've created so I can travel to the guests and have authentic in-person conversations because I believe in the importance and power of face-to-face conversations. This costs money to run and you can support this podcast by becoming a sustaining member, liking, subscribing, commenting, and most importantly, sharing with your friends and family. If you're interested in advertising on the podcast, please contact me at theenduranceStudio at gmail.com. Thank you for watching and listening. Before we jump into the podcast, I want to give a quick few seconds mention of a few products that I use that I think are just incredible products. Um, Squirrel's Nut Butter is the first one. They make lube for bikepacking, cycling, and running, and ultra running. Uh, It's just an incredible product. It's locally made in Flagstaff, Arizona, in uh, the place I live, so that means a lot to me. Uh, It's manufactured here. Uh, and they ship out from Flagstaff, uh, and, and it's just a superior product. I started using the uh, Saddle Butter product for bikepacking, and it was a complete, absolute game changer for me. Uh, the Saddle Butter has uh, tea tree oil and peppermint in it, which uh, helps keep the nasty funk down when you're on multi-day bikepacking trips, and it uh, it's antimicrobial, so it keeps the fungal growth down and it smells pretty good too with the peppermint uh it's an amazing product i've also used their uh other anti-chafe lubes for running and stuff just works it's it's a fantastic product Uh, i am an ambassador for squirrels uh love the product wanted to be an ambassador for them and wanted to spread the lube love for them so i do have a discount code for you on that uh it's in the description also it's 10% 10% off on all the lubes if you use code TIMBERFRIENDS with a capital T. Uh, so that's T-I-M-B-E-R-F-R-I-E-N-D-S. Timber Friends with a capital T. Timber is the name of their squirrel mascot. So go check them out. Squirrels Nut Butter. Game changer. And another company I'd like to mention quickly is Catula. Based out of Flagstaff, Arizona, they make exceptional crampons shoe gaiters, and running traction. And I've been doing a lot of time uh, running in the winter this year and um, on snowy and icy areas in and around Flagstaff. And uh, it's the first time I've ever used shoe traction. And let me tell you, it was a complete game changer for me. Uh, Amazing stuff. And uh, we will get into that uh, on the episode that we have Chris on about some of the uh, technology that goes into technology and engineering that goes into the Catula design products. Um, I also use the gaiters for bike packing and running, uh, to keep the rocks and dirts and debris and stuff out of my shoes. So amazing products, go check them out, Catula.com. And the last one I want to mention is dispersed bike packing gear. Uh, Andrew and Katie Strimke are incredible people. They're incredible endurance athletes, both of them. And they make really exceptional bikepacking bags. Uh, Dispersed.bike is the website there. Um, Andrew's done the Tour Divide. He did the Triple Crown, which is Arizona Trail Race, Colorado Trail Race, and the Tour Divide, all on a single speed, all in the same year uh, with bags that he made. So if you're going to buy bikepacking bags, I'm gonna buy, if I'm going to buy bikepacking bags, I'm going to buy them from someone who has gone through the gauntlet of bikepacking and knows firsthand how to make an excellent bikepacking bag. So go check them out. They're great people. They make a fantastic product uh, and support them if you can. It's dispersed.bike. Today's guest is a skilled outdoorsman, backpacker, bikepacker, engineer, and industrial designer. He currently works in design development and operations at Catula a company based in Flagstaff, Arizona, and they make some of the best shoe traction, gaiters, and crampons in the business. 
I'd like to welcome an engineering genius and my friend, Chris Bunch. A lot of people don't really know what industrial design is when you tell them that. So I like to describe it as half engineering, half art. Uh, and in my case, uh, with the focus on human factors, that was a big part of the Arizona State University program. Um, so yeah, I mean, it really is sort of uh, looking at things that people use and, and understanding how they use them and how they work and bringing in all sorts of factors like that to create a successful thing that people interact with and a, a good product. Right. And it clicks in well with Catula making yeah. uh, crampons and um, traction. What's the, I, I don't, I've never used the uh, crampons, mm -hmm. right? I've used the traction and the gaiters. And so I'm really familiar with those. Is the crampon business a pretty big part of the Catula business? It's definitely smaller compared to the stretch on traction. Okay. But it's really critical part because those are really the best flexible crampons that you can still buy. And um, having those products in our line for people that really need them and then when they need them to have a product that works so well is really critical for us. Yeah. Is uh, a lot of that business in like Europe, the crampon business? Uh, not as much as you would think. They are popular there. Our yeah. KTS crampon is really popular there. Um, but really, our most of our business is still really popular in the USA. We're expanding in Europe right now. Yeah. Yeah, because you seem to... I know you travel there a lot and yep. for various things. Yep. So um, it's just in my brain, I think you know, Swiss Alps yeah. cramp on. Well, it's true. <laughs> I, know, I mean, the sort of impetus for Danny starting the company was a fall in the Italian Dolomites. So you're right. Oh. You're right. Like with a dude your, fell. Yeah. Or he like fell, he fell and hurt himself or died or? down a icy gully. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the whole story that started the company is he had a, a bad, well, it didn't turn out. He, he didn't really get hurt really badly. Um, luckily, but he did have a fall down an icy gully and, uh, Danny. Yeah. Oh, this was okay. This in, was in, before he started Catula in Italy. Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah. That's how it started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he was like, we're going to change. We're going to do something about this. Well, he came back looking for a product that would have solved his problem and he couldn't really find it. Hmm. So he started prototyping stuff in a garage with like a hacksaw. And some shelving that he was bending in a vice. That's like all he had wow. at the time to, to prototype with. And he started learning why it hadn't been solved. It's quite difficult. At the time, crampons were really only designed for mountaineering boots, rigid mountaineering boots. And that's pretty easy. Like you could you could have that as like a grade school project. A stiff shoe is easy to fit something to. As soon as you want it to be flexible, lightweight, and packable, it gets a lot more complicated. And what was his background? He has a degree in physics. Okay. Yeah, but he's super mechanically inclined in general. So, um, and I mean, using the the being an outdoor product user and needing something that's really going to work for you can be a, a large driver. Yeah. Interesting. And w how long ago was this? That I think the, if I remember correctly, the well, Catula was founded in 1999, and it took him a few years to to design and launch the KTS Crampon was the first product. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what year the accident was, but it was a couple of years before that. Wow. And he was in Flagstaff. He lived in Flagstaff at that time? He lived in Utah at the time, but very shortly after that, moved back to Flagstaff because his family's always been from here. Okay. Got it. And that's kind of the origin of um, it starting in, in, in town here. Yeah. Flagstaff here. Yeah. That's interesting. And then how long uh, the Crampon product was kind of the um, flagship uh, product? For line. sure, yeah. And then the next was traction? Really? Um, let's gators. see here. Next was, we actually made snowshoes for a while. So when I started at Catula, the very first thing I did was I hit the ground at a sprint, basically trying to get these snowshoes designed and out onto the market. And they were really cool. I've heard about these. They, I had a, they were I really had a cool. buddy that was like, did, does Cthulhu make these like slip on <laughs> snowshoe things? Do they make those anymore? I heard about. Yeah, these. we don't make them anymore. They were, they were really unique. They actually had like a, we called it a trail crampon and it clicked in and out of the snowshoe deck because a lot of times you'll be needing a crampon, you'll get to powder and then you typically you'd have to switch devices on your feet and then you'd be in the powder for a while and you'd, in inevitably you'd come up on a section where you don't really need the deck, but you need traction. So you'd have to switch back and forth. 
this system let you just click in and out from a crampon to a snowshoe really seamlessly. Yeah. And it was cool because then the snowshoe decks were flat, really relatively flat, and they nested really well. You could put them on your pack really easily. Right. Um, really cool product. We actually like assembled them in Flagstaff. Okay. That's like our design area now is used to be production. Okay. And actually they were even produced at a different smaller shop before that. Um, and they were really neat, but they were expensive to make for sure. Mm. And man, the snowshoe market's tough to, to get into. And eventually the traction focus really took over and we're really experts in that. So it, that, that focus just outweighed those snowshoes eventually. Yeah. I still look back at it positively, but yeah, we don't make them anymore. Yeah. So, but a really interesting concept because you're carrying less stuff, yeah. right? Because it's more uh, multi-use. The yeah. stuff that you are carrying is more, you don't have to carry two sets of snowshoes. For sure. Yeah, I could eat when I was up with the, um, after the couple of snowstorms up here, I um, was using the traction to get up mm -hmm. and then I got up onto the Mesa and then like got into two feet of powder. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is not like the, the, they had platforms but they're still just the width of your feet so they weren't snowshoes right and i was like yeah. i kind of wish i had snowshoes right here and i yeah. like trudged through the snow to get out to a road that was like packed packed powder and was able to get from there but yeah um i thought about that and then my my the friend of mine said you know mentioned that and i was like huh chris has never said anything about that <laughs> yeah so that's cool so then so you that so that was kind of the you came on board with katula that was th those were winding up at that point yeah um so Basically, before I got hired, they had showed this snowshoe at a trade show. It was actually a, a revamped version of the same concept. So the whole concept started out before I was there uh, with a, a product called the Flight Boot. And it was like an overshoe. So it was super warm. And that had like a full cramp on on the bottom. And it clicked in and out of the snowshoe deck. And that was hard to sell because now you're mi mixing and matching different sizes of boots with different sizes of snowshoe decks. It was a little difficult. Yeah. So the thing got redesigned into a trail cramp on that got went onto your shoe and that interfaced with the deck. So I think that was a great idea. And that was in its going through like its second iteration, kind of like moving from parts that were literally machined in the shop to getting injection molded, being a lot more dialed. Yeah. That was shown at a trade show. And really when I, when I got on board, it was like, let's make this thing like a really sweet reality. So I was straight out of school. I started there a week after I graduated designing these relatively complex injection molded pieces and uh, they had to work and be tough and be durable and comfortable. And it was a, it was a good fun challenge for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you were kind of thrown into the deep end a yeah. little bit. Yeah, exactly. It's a good best way to learn. I it guess, was right? great. Yeah. And luckily, you know, Danny was working there with me side by side and uh, I was learning a lot from him quickly about the overall design intent of these snowshoes and I, I i had never used snowshoes before that i started using them very quickly to to learn as much as i could but you know he kind of crash course me through it at the time yeah yeah and that's you know that's one of the things that i love about katula and the people that work there yeah right? we, we were friends um we've been friends for a while mutual acquaintance first and then we became friends in yep. bikepacking uh, got got into biking together but uh the one thing that i love about katula and that i'm such a fanboy over is <laughs> like the people that design the stuff use the stuff yeah exactly it's just like you know you're getting a product i, I think any product like stremke uh with dispersed yeah you know um he he, he did the triple crown and um if you're going to buy a bike packing bag, my theory, you're going to buy products, buy them from people that are like putting them through the grinder. Absolutely. Right. The, the employees are putting them through the grinder and they have people outside testers and stuff like that. Yeah. So and that's just one of the things that I've always been like, you know, really um, appreciative of Catula is everybody's passion that works there. Everybody's just so cool, you know, and yeah. you know, local, everybody's local. Yep. So it's just, it's all a feel good story. The whole thing's like a feel good story. Yeah. And to this day, Danny's the, most hardcore product tester we still have really oh yeah he he beats up everything we give him and that's yeah. awesome oh yeah it's 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 outstanding yeah so then how long after the uh snowshoe venture 
did you kind of, or how did you kind of move into the traction world after that? So they had some traction product. So the micro spikes were launched in 2007. So they had been around for a couple of years before I got there. I started in May of 2010. And believe it or not, it was not a huge market like it is now. Um, it was still relatively small. Hmm. And at the time, that was the only stretch on traction product we had. So we had the KTS crampon, some snowshoes, uh, micro spikes. I think that was everything. I think that was everything we had at the time. And really, what ended up happening was I finished the snowshoe project and it sort of moves into like a manufacturing phase. And I had some, a lot of work kind of helping keeping that going smoothly, but it was sort of like, okay, what's, what's going to be next? And started asking kind of our sales and marketing teams, what are the problems that you're hearing about? And really the funny thing is we weren't having a lot of problems per se with anything going on. So then I moved to, well, when something does break, what, what is it? And quickly figured out, okay, the micro spikes have some opportunities to, to be improved. Uh, and then I started on a whole kind of endeavor to, to find every improvement I could for those. And that really hasn't stopped since then. And it's been, we, I mean, we're on our fourth iteration of the micro spikes now. So yeah, every time we can improve something we do. Yeah. And, and the micro spikes here, I have some samples yeah. here. I brought the, so we can kind of look at these um because this was kind of you gave me the crash course on all the different um traction products uh because i kind of had no i was going into this completely green <laughs> yeah like like you blew my mind with your data download <laughs> and the, the micro spikes are um kind of the most robust robust i guess of of, of, of the traction products yeah highest level of traction that we offer in a stretch on traction product Right. Yep. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're bomber and yeah, you put those things on and it transforms what you can do in the winter. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so for the people just listening, they are, they're kind of an angular spike and it, it it's kind of like a fe- flexible rubber, uh, uh, rubber. What is this plastic? What is this called? TPE thermoplastic elastomer. Okay. Yep. And that kind of stretches over the boot. Um, and then it's got kind of a chain connection system that um, with with these like hardened are these uh, st- steel hardened stainless steel yeah hardened stainless steel spikes that are kind of angular with what looks like reinforced uh, bends on them so they're like something you don't want to walk on the sidewalk with right <laughs> which is a perfect tee up for uh, yeah right uh, because they're just they're really beefy and they seem to be for like the most extreme traction conditions um like hiking up in big mountainous oh uh, yeah icy spots yeah you uh, many people are using these to summit 14ers do stuff in just really gnarly ice conditions um it is amazing what this has unlocked people to be able to do in the winter especially with something that can ball up and literally fit in the pocket of your jacket yeah. And, and so what was the what was the most recent innovation that you made on this from the last iteration of this product? Uh, the biggest thing was these integrated eyelets. So that's what we call them. So embedded in the stretchy TPE is a harder TPU piece um, that solves the problem that, you know, if you have a soft material that can stretch eventually, just like a rubber band, you'll be able to tear something out of it. By embedding these harder TPU pieces in here, we just exponentially increase the durability. Yeah. That actually took a long time. We actually have a patent that just issued like a few days ago about this. Okay. And then uh, after we figured that out, uh, which that actually initially came on the nano spikes, really the other big innovation was this toe bail here. So this prevents the, you don't want the toe to be able to stretch on the, on the TPE harness, especially running downhill, you know, your toe acts as a wedge. The last thing you want is your foot going through the front of this thing. Okay. So not having that part be stretchy is really critical and integrating it as a flexible, lightweight piece with the same TPU is a really big thing. Cool. Yeah. So, so then this evolved, like, like I said before, this isn't something you want to walk on the sidewalk with. It's too beefy. And that got the wheels turning for you. Yeah. And not only, not only for us, but 
we always are listening to customer feedback too. Um, especially like, you know, a lot of our experience at Catula back at this time that, that we're getting into here was very focused on the trail. And we finally started hearing from people saying, you know, I love these micro spikes. These things are absolutely killer. It's changed the way that I can do my stuff in the winter. I wish you guys also made a version with shorter spikes and smaller chains. And so we thought about that and we made some prototypes and it's like, okay, we could do this. But then we started asking, well, why do you want that? And we started finding out, well, I want to be able to use these during the week to like walk my dog or, or run around my neighborhood for easy training, you know, before or after work. Yeah. You know, then we started to realize quickly, oh man, the shorter spikes and chains are not really good for that. You still feel the spikes against your feet and the chains wear out fast against the sidewalk. You don't really wear them out fast on the trail whatsoever, but as soon as you get on an abrasive sidewalk or those places where you're going in between patches of ice back to asphalt, yeah. Um, can wear them out pretty quickly. They're also heavy. Yeah. Uh, chains and spikes are, are heavy, right? So we basically said, well, we're hearing about a cool, legitimate need here. Let's go ahead and see what we can do. And through a, man, the, the whole podcast could be long enough to tell you about the design of the nano spikes, but that's really what eventually came out of it. Yeah. Was the nano spikes. Yeah. Yeah. And those are, let's pull those out here. They're, uh, they're really cool i put some wear on these <laughs> yeah yeah these are so fun to use aren't they yeah no i mean they're they're incredibly versatile like we'll get to the exos but yeah um the nano i like the nanos are they are so much fun the first time i went out <laughs> yeah. you saw a video i was like scared to run full speed it was like a leap like a like a what a faith fall or whatever they call it. Yeah. Where you like, trust fall. A trust fall. Yeah. That's what it was. But with the ice block <laughs> yeah, for me totally. and there was, it was just me in the ice and I was just like, all right, I'm going to strap these on and I'm going to run as fast as I can over this sheer sheet of ice. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to trust Chris. <laughs> yeah, He says they'll work. <laughs> yeah. And did it dude. And it was like Velcro. It yeah. was like better traction then like I had better traction on the ice than I did on just regular pavement. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Like, like it, it like blew my mind that I didn't. And, and my wife, Jess, she's always like, <laughs> she's like every winter. She's like, you should try the traction. You should try the traction, you know, try the, try my spikes, try my spikes. And I'm like, eh, nah, nah. And I think this year, the difference was I got more into running, you mm -hmm. know, and I was like looking to like diversify my wintertime activities. And, uh, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. I can run almost anywhere, anytime now. Yeah. That's the idea. Like other than when it's like two and a half feet of powder. Right. That was the only, that was my limit, right? That was the limit I reached. But mm -hmm. so anyway, these, these were designed for that, for running on pavement and absolutely and sidewalks yeah. and walking your dogs and stuff like that. Yeah. So with these, we managed to solve all those problems that I mentioned. They're way lighter weight than micro spikes because they don't have a lot of stainless steel that's connecting them. Mm -hmm. uh, really the only stainless steel on these are rivets. And this is actually the version two, you know, at the, in the first version, it had little stainless steel links to connect the elastomer to the traction components. Um, but very lightweight, extremely comfortable with this kind of dual durometer TPU that we use here, really comfortable. Uh, and yeah, like you mentioned, these carbide spikes, a lot of people describe them as sticky into the ice. It's incredible. And we've been selling. So again, this is a, pr a pretty new version here. W the old, the older version that we sold, we sold since 2014, I think maybe even, yeah, I think that's when it actually hit customers hands. Mm. I've never seen one come back with a worn out carbide spike. I mean, it's incredibly durable. Yeah. And for people just listening, this is it's got the same webbing on the top kind of as the micro spikes like that same sort of idea. And then it's got kind of these flat plates that sit against your shoe, uh, with these carbide tips that are, that are kind of built in, in a pattern. It also has on the inside, uh, kind of these knobs, these like traction knobs that, uh, they seem to like lock in with the, the yeah. grip on your shoe or, um, the, 
tread on your shoe. Yeah, you got it. They sort of interface with those gaps and, and get it locked in. And it kind of slips and locks into place. And then on the underside, it has a series of these carbide tips. And then it has like fins almost, like horizontal fins. Yeah, that's new for this version too. This okay. helps a lot in like looser conditions and it 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 helps a lot. Um, not only with like looser conditions, but if you hit like a knuckle of ice, uh, these will actually divert that more into a spike. So these are kind of dual dual purpose for us yeah yeah you can tell i've kind of worn these out mm -hmm. um the, but everything well i've worn out the the plastics wearing a little but the carbide tips are like perfect and that's really normal with what we see like you're just you're just getting started on these yeah this type of wear is like the break-in wear and then after this they'll just keep keep going these things have come back to me with thousands of miles on them it's pretty cool is there like a suggested period of replacement that you guys know mm. nothing official yet as long as you thousands <laughs> we tell people yeah to inspect them and as long as there's no cracks and like i have the only i mean i've seen very rare instances where someone who's on the like larger end of the size spectrum and is a heel striker will wear this arm completely down eventually and okay. that, again that takes forever and i've seen one instance where someone actually started to wear the plates down in the centers and it was amazing because all the carbide was still working so they just they literally like found the end of the life of the product interesting so the new changes on this from the last version are the the links to the rivets so yep. you so instead of the connection points being links which what dug into feet or caused problems it, with your toes it or caused something? some people some discomfort in the toe for sure these are these are really comfortable now yeah for sure i can't when i when i wear it i can't feel them yeah on, it's, on the front it's a lot yeah, it, the the comfort's huge improvement. And it has an integrated toe bail, just like the micro spikes now. Mm -hmm. uh, before, it was like a separate piece because that was before we had designed the integrated toe bail. So that also contributes to the comfort. Uh, we switched to a one-piece design for the traction base. It just sort of cleans everything up, makes it a lay against the shoe a lot cleaner. So before, we had a front plate and a rear plate, and now you can see it's all one piece in the middle right here. Oh, yeah, I see right uh like i said the these things in the these traction bars down the center are new we did redesign the shape of the lugs it to be more of like a scoop the first version were hexagons the scoop does actually make a difference i think in loose terrain as well i can i can tell a difference yeah the carbide is concave on this new model that's that velcro kind of stickiness you're describing yeah this this part bl blows my mind <laughs> yeah the and first version had a domed piece of carbide and we never really wanted that because it does still work but if you're if you're not going like full clip like you were if someone's like a little not sure how it's going to be you could feel that thing barely slide before it snaps into the ice and that was something we couldn't get a a manufacturer to make a concave carbide spike for a while because it's so tiny they had a high defect rate um trying to make these things and it was it wasn't working out for the carbide manufacturer um it took a lot of work to to get to a point to make this spike durable and reliable to make and to the specification that we need and now that we have it it's always what we wanted it to be yeah and it, yeah it is incredible and nice and on the tip, I, I think the thing that um, you've described to me in the past that I think is most fascinating is the physics behind having all of the pressure, like it, it's don't, it's uh, concave, yeah, uh, because it then distributes all of the weight and all of the pressure to these very small points along the outside yeah, like of that rim. tip, yep. the rim of that tip, mm -hmm. which you you had said that the for traction the 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 underlying principle is you want the most amount of pressure in the smallest amount of point right yeah you got it and so that's what maybe perhaps makes these different than other like non like off-brand traction yeah right like is that dome tip to the car to the um to the concave tip on the carbide that's a big part of it the other thing like the last thing and kind of rolling into the differences for Cthulhu products so we also changed the elastomer, elastomer band and shape and the whole fit of this thing to fit like more modern footwear. So, I mean, flashback to 2014, running footwear did not look like it looks in 2024. Um, 
yeah, Hoka kind of S- screwed all that up, didn't they? All sorts <laughs> of stuff has changed. And, you know, we want to, this to be a product that works for people that are actually in their sport. And those people are all wearing new foot, new footwear styles yeah. and whatever is the latest, greatest. And I really mean that like footwear. I mean, footwear is incredible now. Um, so that's the other thing is, yeah, we actually care about how this stuff fits. We want to make sure that it's, it's actually working. Um, I think people would just be amazed how much we put into every single detail that you can see on this product where it's one of the, I think we're one of the few companies where you could point to any single thing on this, on any of these products and probably hear for an hour about why it's there. It's, it's that level. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's your style. I think. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, like the passion in the production and the engineering yeah. is just, that's where it's at, man. Like anybody, like anybody who's making something that's that passionate about it and can talk for hours and hours and hours and hours. Like, Dude, the data dumps that you gave me are just, that's like, I, I, you make me excited about it. <laughs> right. And, and then knowing about all of the little things like this is what really, um, understanding when I'm, when I'm using, cause you, you data dumped all of it to me and then I went out and used it and I was like, I can feel what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. It was so cool. So, yeah. and I just wanted to like spread the love as much as possible after that. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, cause it's just so cool. So, um, and these, these tips are, uh, they're, they're like embedded in a a softer piece or. Yeah. They're, they're essentially pressed into a really lightweight aluminum anchor. You don't want to make the carbide piece too big. It is heavy, but it can also become brittle if you're not careful with how you design the part. Like I said, never seen a broken or worn down spike. I think I've seen maybe one or two that have become missing because somebody managed to wear the aluminum down so far, but that. I'm talking a percentage point so small here that we can't fathom it. Like it's so tiny. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the aluminum anchor, I mean, it's crazy how much is going on beneath this that you can't even see. The aluminum anchor is embedded in here in a way that you cannot pull this piece out. It's hard to pull this out with a pair of like cut proof gloves in a, in a vice with a, a sharp blade. It's super hard to get these out. Yeah. And yeah, when we were designing this thing, like I said, Danny used to get the samples in from the manufacturer and like 30 seconds later, he's outside kicking it as hard as he could until we figured out how it was going to come out and it was back to figure out how we could get it to stick better. Yeah. I actually have like a series of these aluminum holders in my, at my desk to remind myself like how much those little things make a difference yeah. because yeah, it, it is unbelievable how secure these are now. Yeah. Cool. So micro spikes evolved into the nanos and then you launched the nanos. Yeah. And then. And so for years we had micro spikes and nano spikes and we felt like, okay, cool. We have sort of everything covered from, you can do anything from like in the nano spikes from walking your dog to, I mean, we had ultra endurance athletes using these to train for ultras because so they could train in the winter from their front door right Mm -hmm. and it was awesome i started getting people at trade shows that would come up looking for me to thank me for designing these that was when it started to click for me how much these were helping people yeah and then on the flip side we get we're lucky we don't even have to search it out we get amazing stories from people using micro spikes to do just genuinely incredible stuff so for a long time, it was like, man, this is awesome. We we have this totally covered. And it was funny. Eventually, we went to a trade show. And um, it was weird. A lot of times, this stuff slowly sort of materializes and a need arises. It was the opposite for exospikes. It was like one big aha kind of thing. Yeah. We go to a trade show. And actually, we have a... at our In our trade show booth, we have big blocks of ice like an ice, ice carver uses. And we put them on the ground so people, anybody can come right up to the booth, stretch these things on and try it out. And cool. people get that moment you had where they're like terrified to go on this block of ice and in one step they're like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we were doing that with these and we started hearing people say like, so people are trying these like one micro spike on their one foot and a nano spike on the other foot and they're deciding which one's for them. 
And it was odd at this one trade show. People kept saying, all right, I think those micro spikes are maybe like a little too extreme for what I need. They're really cool. But like, I think I'll go for the nano spikes. But I could do like a, a little bit of hiking in those too, right? And we'll tell them, we'd tell them, honestly, like, I don't think you're going to be happy with that. Like these nano spikes are not designed for off camber trails, rocky trails. Um, that's just not what they're designed for. Yeah. Or, and then on the flip side, people would say, oh man, these micro spikes are cool. I'm not intimidated by these. This is, this is what I need, but I could still like do neighborhood runs in them too. Right. And we're like, you can, but your feet might hurt and they might yeah. wear down real fast. Yeah. Well, and the, and the, mic and the, the micro spikes have kind of that flexible base. Yeah. The, the chain base yeah. and the, um, the reason why that the, uh, nanos don't really do well in off cambers because these plates yeah they'll slide a little if you get into gnarly terrain right and you can't really have everything because the the beauty of the plate on the road is it's so comfortable right yeah for sure yeah you forget it's there you do like yeah. you, you can hear it the only reminder that i had click, the spikes click. on was the clicking yeah. yeah yeah that was it so so we we started realizing people really want a hybrid product yeah and it's a super legitimate need. And at the time, um, oh man, the timing was really weird. This was right right before COVID. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting. You know, shortly after that, the, the amount of people getting outside was blowing up. Yeah. And it was like, okay, there are more and more people on the trail that need something that is more versatile. They're not going to be doing only trail stuff or only trying to, to do training runs during the week. And essentially it was like, we, we essentially need like the crossover vehicle of the traction world. And frankly speaking, we didn't really know if that was going to be possible for a while because they have drastically different requirements. Yeah. But regardless, we decided to do some investigations and that's how it works at Cthulhu. Like uh, Brad was working for us by this point and he, he was along for this whole exospikes development portion. And Brad and I just started prototyping stuff like crazy. So we'd, we'd start making stuff. The beauty of, of prototyping stuff in the winter and flag stuff is you can build it and walk outside and try it. Mm -hmm. And we'd have all these prototypes that were nano spikes based. We'd take forever to cut these things up and try different stuff on them. And we quickly figured out there were some shortcomings like that for the trail that we were just talking about. Um, eventually, through probably hundreds of prototypes we started figuring out there was a way to marry the two ideas, take some elements of the nano spikes design, take some elements of the micro spikes design, be really careful about the material set and how you applied design of the kind of the geometry of the product. Yeah. And sooner or later we got to the exo spikes, which were, yeah. I think a real game changer for yeah. these products. Trade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a marriage of of both the technologies somewhat. Yeah. So you get those tungsten carbide spikes. They're concave. Th these concave spikes actually started here because they're a little bigger. We were able to convince the manufacturer to go back and work through us on it. And we kind of cracked the code on what we needed. Yeah. So these also have that sticky feeling. Uh, and then these have these bigger scooped lugs. Yep. Uh, these really get down into the terrain. And then the cool thing is the, the TPU traction matrix, we call it, it's flexible. So it, it conforms to, yeah, your footwear when you put it on. And that's a design element from the micro spikes that works so well. You know, having these spike pairs in, they're, they're all able to move independently. That's yeah. a huge part of having effective traction on the trail. Yeah, because if you can imagine trail running, snowy or icy, and there's a chunky section with lots of off-camber stuff, and your foot comes down with force on it, it kind of slides and locks into place and allows these things to, this pattern to move. Exactly. And be flexible and lock into place. And that's, yeah, you, you're totally onto it. Yeah. They're also really light. We also figured out one of the other shortcomings on the trail of uh, having a plate is that you lose access to all that wonderful tread on that nice footwear that you bought. And that might not be helpful in ice, but it is helpful in snow. 
And so the exospikes, we open that back up. We got access to the footwear. On top of that, all of these edges around here all contribute to the traction. Like it, it really does make a difference. Now you did eliminate a lot of the lugs that lock into the bottom of the shoe just because yep. there's a lot less surface area. You got it. Did, did, was there any concern with that, like not locking into place as well? I think at first we were concerned about that, but we very quickly gained confidence in it the more we used it. And if you actually look at your nano spike side by side, you'll see how much shorter those little nubs are on the exospikes. We actually shortened them up because we realized we didn't need them as much. So right. on the nano spikes, these are pretty tall. Right. And you need them like that. The exospikes, they're shorter. You only need a little bit of edge on these because these things are able to move and cam into your lugs on your footwear. And the fact that they're able to move a little means that if you hit a front spike on a on a piece of ice or rock, it's not affecting the spike in the middle of your foot because there's flexibility. You don't enjoy that on the nano spikes. You have to lock that plate in a little bit better. Yeah. Cool. So these are a game changer. Um, I mean, we take these up Mount Humphreys, no problem. People are doing pretty gnarly stuff in these. Uh, they have a really good amount of traction. They're really light. They're 40% lighter than micro spikes. So trail runners really like that. They are more comfortable. Carbide spikes won't wear out if you want to use them around your neighborhood. They're not going to be quite as comfortable as the nano spikes. That's for sure. Yeah. But if you want one thing that can do almost everything, and unless you get into the gnarly stuff where the micro spikes will still really shine, yeah, uh, th this is an incredible product to have in the arsenal. Yeah, and that's that's when I tested both of these, I, I did a very unscientific test. <laughs> no, it's <was> good. <laughs> up a uh, up a hill, a local hill that was covered in snow and had some ice. Mm -hmm. um, the micros are very versatile. Or the nano spikes. The, sorry, the yep. nanos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The nanos are very versatile. Um, th they're, th but they definitely are really best for like running around your neighborhood. Yeah, or urban trails, kind of like where, yeah, that that type of thing. Like y y you could get away with them mm -hmm. on some off camber stuff, and people do it. Yeah, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> it's definitely not. The most versatile, I think. Um, the Exos are, yeah, they seem to be like, if you're going to get one thing, and I said this in my video, if you're going to get one thing, the Exos are going to be the one to get because you can run around your neighborhood. You can also um, go on these ho this off-camper stuff. It's it's definitely most, the most versatile product. It does feel a little bulkier, though. Yep, for sure. You know, like that, that was the only thing that I felt in the difference was... Yeah, you feel that height under your foot. For you do. Sure. Yeah, you do. And That's you, why the nano spikes are so short. Yep, and and so that was the only thing that they just felt bulkier, and I have a tendency to kind of kick the inside of my le my leg when I run. Yep. Whatever my gait's kind of off, and um, it would just I I could I, it was just a little bulkier, um, which which I got used to, and that's fine. Yeah, that's what'll um, happen. But uh, but the weight I think is very sim very close. It's very close. Yeah. I think these are 106 grams per side for a medium for exospikes, I think. And nano spikes, I think, are a little lighter with the version 2 now. But they're close. Cool. Good stuff. Yeah. This is um definitely was a game changer for me. Yeah. So, yeah, and I remember um calling calling you or you called me or something one time and you're like, I'm on the top of oh yeah, Eldon, I was. Mount Eldon, like way up local mountain. Um, and I'm like, I know, <laughs> I know what he's doing up there. He's not just up. He's like, I'm, I'm at work. I'm at the top of Mount Eldon and you were doing some super secret stuff up there. Yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, I loved that part. I was like, yeah, yeah. What a cool job where you, you know? realize like, oh, they are out testing this stuff. <laughs> I'm like, it just snowed. It's probably horrible and icy up there. It was. <laughs> and he went up the backside, which is, uh, uh, what an Eldon lookout trail. Yeah. Which is just like straight Steep. up deep. Yeah. Um, it's the end of Cocodona. I went down it one time with my bike strapped to my backpack cause I was training <laughs> yeah. for my failed attempt at the Arizona trail race. <laughs> Uh, but, and it's just like these huge steps. And that was my first time on that trail. And I'm like, that was your first time on that yeah, trail. Yeah. That's gnarly. Yeah. I'd never been on it. Cause it was not like a bike trail, you know, <laughs> it's no joke. 
for sure yeah. Yeah. huge giant steps with these like big boulders that come in from both sides yeah. and there's like these shoots and I, I i can just imagine the the ice and the shoots of ice and snow and stuff and, yep. and you get into some of the off camber icy trail up towards like the mid and top section too mm -hmm. and that's where like it's good traction testing up there yeah, yeah. perfect place to test it <laughs> but i just loved it that you were like yeah i'm at work <laughs> we're uh we're we're, we're we're working on yeah. some stuff <laughs> like got it uh, i'll call you later yeah. <laughs> uh that's funny so int i'm i'm so i i am very uh on pins and needles about what's going to happen next um with the evolution of these products to to know where they came from and, and and what's coming next so i can't wait for that yeah um so uh, these uh on the exos you still have these uh links these metal yeah. links that hold the top piece to the bottom piece yep we have these on exo spikes and micro spikes still yeah the the rivets are really brand new thing on the the nano spikes that we just launched mm -hmm. uh so yeah we'll see if that evolves to to whatever's next for some of these products but right now i'll only have that on the nano spikes cool cool you know one thing i did want to ask you about is um, you are a very skilled, uh, engineer. Uh, you, you, you seem to be very, um, I put in your bio that you're a skilled outdoorsman. I didn't, can you explain to me how you <laughs> became a skilled outdoorsman? Yeah, sure. Like what was your first, uh, uh, outdoor trip or was it a family thing or did you do boy scouts or yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, my parents both were really outdoorsy, um, for sure. And I remember, so I grew up in New River, Arizona, and we didn't really spend a lot of time like watching TV or, or playing video games or something. We basically played outside. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I remember as a kid, for sure. Even in like the Arizona desert, we'd have to be like training ourselves to watch for rattlesnakes and stuff while we were building tree forts in, in our backyard. So I think that just sort of was a always a thing um and i mean that kept going so when i was in the fifth grade my my dad actually took me out of school for a week from my first grand canyon backpacking trip you know it was important mm -hmm. so i i've always just uh it's funny i've i guess i sometimes think about it and sometimes forget about it it's just always been a a part of my life in some way or another and i go through peaks and valleys of of doing a lot of i for a long time it was mostly backpacking mm -hmm. i'd do a lot of trips and then it would be weird i wouldn't do any for a while start to miss it go back and do a bunch more and every time you get out there you love it yeah yeah so then i went to i, I kind of got into climbing for a while right before i started at katula and i don't know really exactly why i was just doing some hiking out at uh the mcdowell mountain area and I saw these bolts in the rock and I was like, oh man, that looks kind of interesting. And before I knew it, I was buying quick draws and a rope. So I'd spent some years as a climber, um, kind of had some climbing partners that, that came and went and moved in away and stuff like that. And uh, went back to more like the hiking and backpacking route. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then eventually through you basically eventually got you hooked me into bike packing i never really expected to get into it to be honest yeah i got into mountain biking during covid on accident i didn't know that everybody else was actually getting into it i had no no clue that the <laughs> industry was blowing up i really didn't i had no idea i had an old they mountain bike <laughs> well i had an old mountain bike it was like a, a trek that i had bought when i moved to flagstaff in 2010 yeah and i started riding this thing and i had tried mountain biking a bit before but I lived over in Christmas tree and I was trying to like ride this thing. It's not a, not, this was like a basic mountain bike, man. Yeah. I'll wait yeah. for that. Wait for the plane. Yeah. We're in the outdoor studio. <laughs> yeah. So I was trying to ride this thing on forces of nature and I was just having a terrible time. I was like, this sport sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I just did not have fun. Yeah. And it actually wrecked it for me, which was really unfortunate because for some Oh, well, it's actually sort of a funny transition. So when we were designing the exospikes, I actually started trail running because I needed to, to understand what was going on mm -hmm. with the product. That's legitimately why I started. And I, not a very good trail runner. I would, I'd run like, you know, two miles here, four miles here, 
And then eventually I was, I was able to run like an eight mile distance and I wouldn't say I didn't enjoy it, but something just, I just kept sort of saying, wow, this is cool. It's like missing something for me. And I didn't really know why. And for some reason, uh, I took a look at the mountain bike that I had sitting in the corner of my garage and I just decided I'm going to just start riding this thing to work again. So I did that and lo and behold, I started having a lot more fun because I wasn't on forces of nature. Yeah. And it was like, it became really fun really quickly. Yeah. Forces of nature is not a fun trail. No, it's like a nice, (laughs) it's, it's a kind of a nice hike. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool hike, but man, it's a tough doing it on a relatively cheap mountain bike is not the way to start mountain biking. Yeah. So I started getting into it relatively quickly and, and all of a sudden I didn't, I, I, I would still do the, the running to, for the, the product testing, Yeah. but I was dreaming about riding my mountain bike. And I started to remember as a kid, I did get into BMX for a while. Mm -hmm. I used to like BMX race a little bit. And I started remembering why I was like, Oh, I like going fast downhill a lot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, some people like you, you're like into the climb as well as the descent. I I do the climb to do the descent for sure. Like yeah. that's just where it's at for me. Yeah. And yeah, it started to, to click. And then, yeah, I started, uh, I got a mountain bike, uh, started absolutely loving it. And then I decided, uh, I started getting so into it. I, I upgraded my commuting bike and want to commute on a full suspension bike and yeah, I was having a lot of problems getting the derailleur set up on this thing. And I brought it over to you. And I'll never forget the whole, I know exactly the moment that I decided to maybe try bike packing. You were riding that bike around the front. We were making sure it shifted after we worked on it. And you said, oh, this would be a good bike packing bike. And uh, that was the moment. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that was easy. <laughs> that was the moment. I was like, oh. And so sure enough, yeah, I ended up sewing a bunch of bags. It was a relatively small investment. Luckily, I have soft goods development skills. So yeah, yeah, and that's something I wanted to ask, talk <laughs> yeah. about too. Is you, you, a lot of people. There's a little bit of a barrier for bike packing. Yes, I uh, think there is with bags. I mean, it depends on your approach. When I got into bike packing, it, I bought every bag that you could possibly buy. Yeah, and piled as much stuff in as I could, mm-hmm. and uh, and my bike was three thousand pounds. You started with the trailer out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did a Bob trailer. Yeah, that's what I thought. And I piled everything into the Bob trailer <laughs> and put like a mesh strap over it all and, uh, ran out of water on oh, my first trip. Wow. Yeah. And it was like somewhere in Phoenix. It was part of the old Arizona trail route before they kind of linked it all up. So I had everything I needed, but water. And I had this giant thing I was towing around and I quickly learned that like, that's not the way to bike pack. <laughs> yeah. That's the way to tour, but that's not the way to bike pack Arizona trail. Yep. Uh, you need to be nimble. And then, um, and then I went to the bags and, um, got into the, in, into buying all the bags and piling as much stuff on as possible. And then I slowly like slimmed down over time mm-hmm. and kind of learned what I needed or not. But you have had the, the skill set that you knew how to sew and, uh, you, uh, had, like you said, the, the soft fabric skills to be able to make these up. So, yeah. Tell me about that process. Did you, how did you figure out what you were going to use on your bike or as a new person kind of coming into the sport? Oh man. Well, it's important to say the, the backpacking was a big advantage going into this because I didn't have to buy a lot of other gear. Like there's not like a bike packing specific sleeping bag you need. So I already had stuff. right? Right. And even like a tent, you can, you can cram a tent into something many different ways. So uh, knowing my, I mean, I've always been a gear person for sure. I, I love outdoor gear. Um, and so I came into it knowing, okay, I generally already know what I want to use. I just need to know how to fit it on a a bike. Mm -hmm. I definitely took some advice from you from the beginning. I spent a lot of time looking at people's different setups and considering what's going to work out well for me. What do I assume is going to work out well for me is how I should say that. And essentially I thought, okay, I could buy some of these bags and I guess experiment with it, but I'm one of those people that hates trying to resell stuff. I just, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, I guess I could just essentially fail faster here and 
buy some fabric and spend some days at home, like sewing some stuff up and seeing what I like. Yeah. And so that's what exactly what I did. I bought some fabric online and generally knew what to find and uh, made some cardboard templates in my living room and sewed some bags and started trying stuff out. Yeah. The only thing in my current setup that I didn't make was the, the harness for the front. That's just too involved. Well, we proved eventually that it wasn't too involved, but where I yeah. started was way too much for a easy experiment. Right. Um, and then, yeah, like some small kind of hardware things, but all the bags themselves I sewed up. Yeah. And so the reason I'm kind of, yeah, I, I am slowly learning about some things I may want to change on that setup, but I'm been pretty happy with the route that I've started down. Yeah. So you did uh, Black Canyon Trail. Yeah, last weekend i did yeah um most part of well two-thirds of it <laughs> right yeah and uh what did you i i met up with you on part of it um yeah. and you had said that you had broken a couple things i did so yeah so what broke and so my wolf tooth clamp that uh you know my seat bag has a piece of velcro that goes right underneath the seat yeah and i don't want to blame this on them i think i know why it broke I think there's a legitimate reason it broke the more I looked at what had happened to it. Mm -hmm. um, but that broke regardless. I'd say I broke it rather than it broke. Right. Product um, didn't fail. <laughs> it, it did, but it was probably my fault. Okay. Yeah. User, yeah. I think basically uh, for anybody that has that thing, check the tightness and clean out the dust under it more frequently than I did. That's the wolf tooth Valais or Valais. Yeah. I don't say it. know how to say yeah, it. Me neither. The, the product is cool. Um, the problem was I've had that thing on there for like, hundreds maybe th a thousand or something and i hadn't moved it because it was working great where it was and i had no reason to move it yeah. and i think what happened was it finally got some dust ingress in there or something and it one time when i put the dropper down and i hit a bump on accident right at the same time i think the thing moved upwards just enough to have a wedge where the the stanchion starts to flare out and i think it wedged it and cracked it oh uh, okay so I think if I would have cleaned that thing out a little more frequently and just double check the torque, it'd still be fine. Yeah. But so regardless, that thing broke. Yeah. I over torqued mine and broke mine. Yeah. That's how I did it. So that was not its fault either. That was right. my fault. Yeah. Here's a trend here. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was not a, that was really more of an annoyance. Like actually my dropper was still working fine. I just had to pay extra attention to how I was putting it down. But it was a it was a thing to think about for sure. Yeah, because if you go down too far, you're gonna rub your. Is that uh, the purpose you're using it for? You're gonna rub your seat bag on. Actually, not even in this case. It was the whole reason I was doing it was to have a nice solid attachment point for my seat bag. Oh yeah, right. So and I, my seat right. bag again, it's homemade. All it fits is like a a synthetic puffy jacket, pretty small, and a very small Gore-Tex jacket. Right. So, and you were on a hardtail, so there yeah. wasn't suspension. So luckily I didn't have any clearance issues. It was more of a, oh man, I don't know, like, I don't want to be slamming this thing now that it's broken down into the the dropper post at the bottom every time. Yeah. So I actually ended up essentially creating a little suspender out of Velcro one wrap the next day that kept it up around the seat post rails. It actually worked perfectly the rest of the trip. Okay. So that's a good hack carry a little extra i actually think i saw that either in, or maybe you were talking about zip ties maybe but having some extra one wrap and mm -hmm. i was able to rig like i can't it's a suspender for that thing it saved my second day i was literally able to use that thing the rest of the trip without many issues yeah yeah that's yeah velcro zip ties um it's not the, uh, heavy what are the straps called the, oh the vole straps yeah yep yep those those are um something extra to carry i've heard i don't carry those i carry the velcro but yeah yeah because stuff's gonna break yep yeah and then i broke a tent stake this the the morning second day in the morning man these i don't know what was going on i could not get my tent stakes out of the ground i was starting to pry them out of the ground it was just really odd i've never had a tent stake that hard to remove ever yeah. and uh i haven't used these stakes that came with that tent very much i don't think i'll be buying them again yeah um and I actually popped the, they're, they're a multi-piece steak, which I'm not a fan of now. And I was prying it out of the ground with a rock. I was like, oh, surely this will work. It'll get some leverage. Wasn't working. And eventually I bent one of these things and 
this i i went to see if i could straighten it out at all and it just broke right there dang so i wasn't i could have easily still used the broken section for the second night but the other thing was man we woke up that first morning and well i had woke up at three in the morning just to pee and when i woke up i put my headlamp on and i looked down and my sleeping bag was covered in drops of water Mm -hmm. covered and i was like man i this is weird i have both of my tent doors wide open like this this tent can't be more vented and then I got out and it was like, oh, everything is covered in water. Our picnic table, we had a, we had like an actual campsite. Yeah. Everything had water all over it. And I was like, oh, this is just like a bunch of dew. And then between three and six, everything froze. Oh. Everything froze. My tent fly had, had ice on the outside of it. My, my helmet that was on that picnic table had ice. My bike was laying on the ground, you know, the frame bag had ice all over it. It was crazy. Yeah. So it didn't even last that long. As soon as the sun peaked above Sunset Point and it stuff started melting really quickly. Yeah. We still got a super late start that day. Yeah. We started riding almost at 10. Yeah. You were wondering. Yeah, where I was we waiting were. for you guys. Yeah. Because I was going to secret meet up with you. Well, yeah, we didn't. Yeah. That was awesome, by the way. Uh, well, I was just like <laughs> texting your wife, like, <laughs> what's going they on? Okay. Because I'm going to go yeah. up and see if they're yeah, okay. The but problem I don't is, we like... were standing out in the sun holding our sleeping bags trying to get them to dry. Yeah. And they were all wet. Been there. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. You've been we... there bu- backpacking, though, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Packing up wet gear. I mean, that's pretty common. Well, and that happened to you, to us on Craters and Cinder Cones. That oh, yeah. morning was so damp. Yeah. And that morning, this usually isn't that great to do, but that morning I knew we had miles to make. And I was like, I'm just packing stuff up and I'll dry it up when I get the chance. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've been there before. Yeah. And yeah. One time on paintings and pines, it just packed up a ton of wet stuff. It was after <laughs> yeah. a few, and you like, just, you just shove it in and like squeeze out all the water. And then I ended up in at a resupply stop at, uh, camp Verde, I think. And, uh, I was uh, going to plan on spending about an hour eating and recharging stuff. And I like pulled all of my stuff out in the sun and just like dried it all out. You yeah. Know? That's but, usually what you got to do. Yeah. But when you're racing, it's like, it's like a whole different level of complexity, you know? Yeah. So well, that, that's, uh, I think that's kind of what led to us deciding to call it early though. Mm-hmm. We weren't racing. We were just trying to have a good time on this trip, mm-hmm. but eventually we were at rock Springs and oh, we got really unlucky. We sat down at a picnic table outside and within like 30 seconds i heard the server behind us say oh our kitchen just got an order for 32 people oh man (laughs) i was like this is not good so it was like well we need to eat like we we planned on on you know that being our meal for the day so it was like by the time we were done it was late uh, the water situation gets a lot more complex after you leave. You you cross the Agua Fria pretty quickly after that, and there's no more water. Right. And it was like, man, we could go back out there and ride what we need to in the night and wake up and have a long day tomorrow. Or we could just decide to call it here while we have smiles on our faces without. And it really, by that point, it was like, we've had a good time so far. Like let's not push this and make a good trip into a bad one. Yeah. Yeah. That's wise. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I probably do that a little too easily sometimes <laughs> and other times I'm able to push it. Yeah. I mean, you weren't in a race, you know, yeah. like whatever it's, it's, it's ultimately bikepacking is kind of backpacking and bikepacking. I mean, there's not like races in backpacking, but bikepacking there's obviously like, different very very different distinct types of bikepacking there's yeah. like ultra light ultra fast cover as much ground as quick as quick as possible and be very uncomfortable and be wrecked for weeks afterwards <laughs> yeah. weeks you seem pretty good this was a week ago yeah you don't seem that wrecked it was probably a good decision, no i really you know? wasn't that and was it, what was funny yeah it's really like what do you want to get out of it you know and, exactly you know i mean it's about your goals uh once you go into it and you know Tyler and I did that same trip and we, we stayed in the same spot. The first night we camped was at Bumblebee, yep. which is, I don't know, 40 something miles in to the, yeah, 42, 44 from the North terminus. Yep. About 40 ish miles in. And we didn't stay at the ranch though. Mm-hmm. We just stayed like in the dirt in a wash somewhere. <laughs> yep. And, but the same thing happened because it oh, was, did like, it? it was like March. Or, oh yeah. So very similar. Yeah. Um, a year prior and, um, it was, everything was frozen 
and hands were freezing, feet were oh. freezing. We were just like waiting for the sun to come up. Yeah. Um, and we decided we were just going to push all the way through to the end. Yeah. And it turned out like, you know, fast forward 10 PM that night, we're still on the trail. That would have been what happened to us if we kept going. We're not talking to each other, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? We're trudging through the end. Um, he lost his light. Oh man. Yeah. That's not good. He did it. He put it somewhere and it lost it. So we only had one light, which was my light. I got to a point where it was, there was an incredible sun, uh, moonrise <laughs> yeah. coming up. Right. And I, we were kind of, ha I was kind of getting into the zone of having this like incredible, uh, psychedelic, ex natural psychedelic experience. Yep. Um, like, whoa, we're out here and this is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was an incredible, it was like a blood moon that was coming up over the, oh. the, the mountains of Phoenix. It was just incredible. Yeah. You know? And, uh, two full moons in a row, which, so, but I kind of like that now. Mm -hmm. I kind of like a little masochistic and there are those people that like the pain of bike packing. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's like the rest of the world who just wants to like go and have a good time. Right. Or I'm in the place I, right now, I think where I swing between the two of sometimes I go out and that's okay. And other times I go out and I don't want anything to do with it. It's really weird. Yeah. 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 So well, and then, then there's another, uh, back to your story, the, was there that little psychological pull of comfort where at Rock Springs, we're right by the highway. For sure. There's food, <laughs> there's comfortable chairs. It's funny. Oh, for sure. Especially when you go out with the mindset of, oh, this is a party paced trip. Yeah. It's like, we're not going to kill ourselves is already in your brain before you even leave. Yeah. Um, it was funny because I was thinking about Craters and Cinder Cones when you and Tyler and I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And I needed what happened on that trip where we all told each other, like, don't take the highway shortcut. Mm -hmm. And that made me get there. And I didn't even think about taking it that day. Didn't yeah. even cross my mind. It was like, oh, screw that highway shortcut. Like, I'm ready to ride through the cinders. Yeah. And I need that sort of like... Um, like I, it's funny. I make certain different types of trips in my head where I say this one's going to hurt a little bit or it's not. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've been kind of like uh, working on like visualization a little bit, which mm -hmm. I think is kind of what you're alluding to. Yeah. Um, visualizing certain points that are going to be difficult for me emotionally or mentally. Yeah. Um, I vis I literally like imagine myself through it. As I'm going through it, like Arizona trail race, I had a couple of those that I, I knew that I knew the course and I knew the points that I was going to have difficulty on. And I just kind of like imagined myself and that actually helps me. I don't know. It's kind of woo woo, but like, no, I think it helps you like imagine a spot where you are having success, you know? Yeah. Um, which makes it a little easier, but, um, but yeah, I mean, all in all sound like you, uh, in hindsight, made the good call. Are you going to go back and give it another go? Yeah, eventually I think I will. Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed the trail a lot. Yeah. It's super cool out there. It's just like an awesome piece of Arizona up yeah. against those mountains and super. Yeah, I'll, I'll go be back. Yeah. Bla yeah, Black Canyon Trail is a gym. It's a hidden gym. For sure. Like, it's 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 a, it's a special place. Yeah. It's close, to, close enough that I think it's really good for a new... A uh, person who's uh, someone who's new to desert bikepacking. Yep. It's a good little sample of the desert bikepacking scene. Yeah. Which really, that was, I'd maybe put that into the, like, my third desert bikepacking trip. So mm -hmm. that's relatively fresh. I mean, I'm relatively fresh into bikepacking, but. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about that trail, and this is why I said, I think in my text to you even, I said, I'll be back. Um, I think that's an amazing trail to test out different pieces of kit on. Mm -hmm. because I actually wanted to take a much more minimal, uh, like sleep setup. I really wanted to take a, a really minimal setup Yeah, and there was a chance of rain in the forecast and I don't have that, that system dialed yet. I'd love to go back and change a few things and see how different it is. And I think that trail is, would be a trail that would really shine on different gear choices. Yeah. So what do you, what do you, thinking of for your sleep kit uh so with with that trip i took a tarp tent which is a, a lightweight tent but it's still a full a full tent um what's the I, brand on uh it's a, literally made by tarp tent tarp tent yep. is the brand it's name. a moment dw tent okay and i like that tent but it's still 
So what I'd like to do is go back with a bivy, like a small, I bought a, a small catabatic bivy. It's like only eight ounces. It's the size of like a baseball. Yeah. It's crazy small. Uh, and then I'm. No pole on it? Uh, no, no pole. Yeah. So does it have like, a no, no screened in or does it have just it like. It has a... mesh okay. uh, for like the top half of your body, which I think I, I definitely give off a lot of perspiration when I sleep. I yeah. S- I, for sure. So I wanted something with some breathability. Yeah. That one seemed to work for people that that have that same kind of need. Uh, what it does have is two, like a head and a foot tie out that are optional. Yeah. So like, I think I'll probably just tie the mesh up off my face to my bike handlebar, let the feet be on my sleeping bag. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to do that with just a backup, like small tarp. So I ordered a, a Bora tarp. That isn't here yet. So when I get that set up, I'd love to go back and try that out out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think, I mean, I have a really sweet Western mountaineering sleeping bag. And I'm glad I brought it on that trip because it did dip below freezing and I was nice and comfortable and warm. I did not have a problem with that. Yeah. Um, But I think I'll get an even smaller one from them. So when it's a couple degrees warmer, you might be able to cut like almost half the weight of my bag. And so I want to get to like a much tidier kit in the front. And I think I need to, I think I need to mess around with how I'm carrying water. I, right now I'm carrying a lot of water on the handlebars and it has pros and cons for sure. Yeah. But I think for that kind of chunky terrain, I need to just try some other stuff. Yeah. And with a lot of hike a bike, if there's terrain yeah. with a lot of hike a bike, I I've, um, really made bad tactical choices carrying too much water on my fork. Yeah. That's the same problem I'm encountering. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll try to maybe, uh, play around with putting it in the bottom of the frame bag or somewhere more central and low on the bike. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, if you're doing a lot of hike a bike and you load up your, uh, fork with a bunch of weight, water weight, uh, like 15 pounds of water weight, right. You do a few liters on your fork. Yeah. I had three on my fork. Okay, so you got some serious weight on there, and now you're if you're doing a lot of uh, terrain, it's that's okay for like a gravel ride or something yeah, where you can roll. The it whole almost time. doesn't even matter for those. Yeah, because you're you're you got momentum, but you know if you're get like Arizona Trail Race or um, BCT where you got a lot of getting on and off the bike and a lot of pushing and hike a bike, you're lifting all that weight up every time. Oh, that's so you're wrecking your shoulders. On top of that, I found a. Uh... For like that descent, oh man, the descent that first day down into Bumblebee is like epic. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. It's really sweet. Yeah. And I figured out through that, um, I was having, I was not getting enough back wheel traction. Like my brake became ultra touchy. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because all the weight was on the front of the bike. Yeah. Interesting. And I don't want it off the back of the bike per se. I think I just need it more central. Yeah. I've heard the best spot is low and centered yep. so to gonna, carry your weight. I'm going to try that exact thing. Yeah. I've found, and you weren't, uh, you were wearing like a backpack or just a hip pack. Okay. I've tried to keep a lot of weight off my body. That's still something I'm having huge. So I tried that new, uh, chamois that you recommended. It definitely helped. Yeah. But I'm still just trying to break in my butt with the being in the saddle, especially with a lot of on and off the bike. Yeah. Something I'm still trying to figure out. So with that, I've really tried to get weight off my body to help as much as possible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've, I, in my past, I've tried for water, like I've tried water on the back and I would carry like four liters on my back and I would get horrible saddle sores. <sighs> yeah. Right. And then I went to the fork solution and I wrecked my shoulders because I was lifting up this heavy bike over these big steps. Yep. Um, and then I did try the frame bag uh, water solution and I didn't particularly like that because of all of the wear and tear that your frame bag gets. I was totally paranoid about wearing a hole in it. That's what I'm paranoid about. And so I kind of landed in this like, well, there's not one spot for your water. You want to carry it over multiple different places and have a variety of spots to carry your water. And I'm a big fan of the vests of running vests. Yeah. Like huge fan of that. Distribute um, it front and back. Love the distribution. Yeah. Cause you got two liters in the back and then you have two, uh, half liter flasks. So you're carrying and those are in the front. So you're carrying three liters in total on your body. And then I usually carry an extra liter in my frame bag or on, uh, the, the down tube. Maybe I'll try that bike. out first. Plus, yeah. I already have a vest, so 
Yeah. That's an easy thing. Yeah. And I, I kind of love the idea of, um, there's this merging as endurance running Mm -hmm. is growing Mm -hmm. and the distances are getting further. There's like this convergence of technology. I totally agree from bike packing to endurance running. And so there's all these things that like are starting to cross over. Like, um, like Dana was the first one I saw was actually like really running a vest. I, I think I've seen a few others, but he was really the first one that kind of talked me into using it. And I was like, why have I not done this the whole time? Like I can barely feel this thing and it's designed for ultra running, but it works better for ultra bike packing. I think. Yeah. Cause you're not like bouncing up and down, you know, I actually did use that vest on a, when I went and bike back the rainbow rim trail and I did that from as a loop from Jacob Lake and some AZT. Mm-hmm. Cause we had to bring so much water on that trip. And I did, I did run it for that with a hip pack. Okay. Cause I needed so much. And uh, it did work really well. Maybe I'll try ditching the hip pack and just using the vest before I do anything else. Yeah. The other advantage of the vest is it sits up high enough that you can access jersey pockets. Mm. So like on Arizona Trail Race, I a lot of my food carrying capacity was in my jersey pockets back in the back. Interesting. And I could still access everything and have the vest and have the like the kangaroo pockets. That I think that's what they call them on the Solomon vest. Because mm-hmm. um, I had to carry like... I had to vary my water capacity and I used extra flasks, which are very small and collapsible to change from four liters to seven liters oh. back to four liters throughout the race. Right. That's a lot. Yeah. Cause like we needed like in every afternoon you needed six to seven liters cause it got so hot. Right. So it gave that like versatility. Right. And I think that that's where I've kind of landed in is the key with, with, over time I've learned is it's about finding these like versatile, versatile items, you know? Yeah. The other thing that, um, the other thing that, uh, I think is one of those crossover products are the, uh, gators, the Catula gators. Yeah. Gators were like a running thing. That was like, I kind of made fun of people that used gators. Yeah. I gotta be honest with you. Like I would, there was like a look to ultra runners. Oh, right? for sure. There was like the big shoes, like the big old boat Catula shoes. Or sorry, not Catula shoes. There was the um, the Hoka shoes. Hoka's, yeah. That, that were just They're like big. these giant boats. And then there was like the gators. And then there was like the running look, right? And I didn't really ever realize it until I started using the gators. Like I used them for bike packing. Yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? Okay, number one, I'm sorry I made fun of people. <laughs> okay, and number two... Why aren't these like, why isn't everybody using these? Yeah. I could understand if you're cycling and you're not doing a lot of hike a bike, but even then there's an argument that all kinds of stuff gets picked up on your tire and deposited in your shoes. And flown up from, yeah. Yeah. And so that, that was, and I, I have some here. Yeah. Um, I, I used the Renegators on the BCT. I was so glad I had them. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. And like they, these were, these are like one of those crossover products from running to uh, bike packing or riding that, yeah. that are a game changer for me. And it's, um, I think I really put them through the gauntlet on pinions and pines yeah. where it was just like a mud, like su- mud, death, mud fest for like, I don't know, eight hours or something. I would add so brutal. much stuff in my shoes, yeah, which just would have added to my just being totally defeated on that thing. Like, it, it's all those little things that add up that can, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And rocks in your shoes or something that like a lot of people have the same experience. Like I'll even say I had it, you know, we didn't, we didn't always make gators. I, I really didn't use them. And then as soon as I started using them, when we decided we wanted to, to make an improved product, it was like, why have I not been using these? Yeah. Well, I found lots of reasons that I hadn't, but with ours, I don't have any of those. I love those now. Yeah. Yeah. But that happens to many people where they, they don't get it until they use it, and then they are they become like a diehard fan. Yeah, and for bikepacking, it's – I mean, I talked to uh, John Schilling, who uh, is the race director of the Arizona Trail Race now, and he's like, yeah, like that's standard protocol. <laughs> like, duh. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, yeah, if there's ever a chance of um, mud or soft sand or bikepacking or hike a bike – like those things are like part of the kit for sure. So that was funny on craters and cinder cones on day two. I remember Tyler, we got to that, that funny camp that you found 
And Tyler <laughs> took off his shoes and he had this moment where he's like, oh my gosh, I haven't had a pebble in my shoe for two days. He's yeah. <laughs> taken off his gaiters. He was, it like registered that he didn't have to think about it. Yep. It was pretty funny. Yeah. And <laughs> you're right. It's all the little things. The longer you go, the more the little things make a huge difference they psychologically. Do. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. I got to pee. Let's Me take a break. Me too. Okay. And we're back. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> okay. So let's see. We were talking about the uh, the Gators. Yeah. Right? Which is also a Catula product. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to dive in a little bit about the technology on these or the engineering on these, the product design, I guess. Yeah. Um, a little bit with you. Right out the gate, there's a couple of things that are, uh, I think, unique about these that are different from other Gator products. Uh, and one is the zipper mm-hmm. on the side, which I have to say is one of my favorite parts, um, especially when I'm bike packing because I can just unzip it and pull my whole shoe off. I don't have to deal with taking the shoe off to get the gator off. I can just leave it attached. Yeah. Take the, cause, cause literally I'm at a point where every little thing matters and I'm just like to- yes. so tired and, and, and completely wrecked. And I just want to like get my bivy out and get in it and sleep for three hours. Cause I'm gonna have to wake up in three hours and go. So I'll, I want to be able to just unzip it, pop my shoe off, get in the bivy. Yep. And that's one really um cool thing. The other thing is the strap on the bottom uh, is a, a design feature that you just don't see on other um types of gaiters kind of the like thinner ones that just kind of pull over the shoe i think that's more the traditional gaiter yeah like a piece of lycra one piece yep right so maybe you can kind of go into the the reasoning behind why these two things were um, yeah were decided on so when we sort of were getting into the i mean when we were getting into this whole category part of what I did was I would, I would try all sorts of other gators that were on the market. And it was honestly sort of hilarious. I would put these gators on and like walk around even like the office all day in them. So I was just spending a lot of time in them. And then of course I'd go use them on the trail too, but I, it was actually shocking how much I learned by wearing them around the office. Yeah. Because you would find yourself doing the same type of things that you would do out on the trail. And um, it was almost like a little more obvious, some of the things that I noticed. So I, I've never really liked those gaiters that you have to put on before your footwear. Right. Cause it's like, I don't want to have to get to the trailhead. Forgot. I put my gaiters on, take my shoes off and redo everything. Right. Cause those, you, you, you put them, you slide them on like socks or whatever, yeah. and then you put your shoe on and then you what slide them back down over your. Yeah. Okay. Or, and, or go to the, try to stretch them over your shoe, which I just, yeah. Right. Um, and then on the flip side, most gators on the market use a uh, Velcro and they're all right up the front. And so if you're in like a, a big boot, that might not really matter. You might not really feel it. But if you're in a trail runner, like a flexible low cut footwear, mm-hmm. that's, I found it really annoying really quickly. It was really crunchy. It's not really comfortable. I didn't really like trying to get the the Velcro all aligned very much. Um, you do get some advantages out of the Velcro. Like you can adjust the, the offset to change the size a little bit and stuff. Yeah. But in the end, it was like, man, these, vel- these zippers are much more convenient. If you're just, if you have a product that has some stretch in it, like these do, you get some of that adjustability. Yeah. Once you figure out how to fit them, the zipper is just so much faster. And yeah, so putting it up the side av- avoids having it go right up the front of your ankle where you're going to feel it. And as soon as you offset it just a little bit to the side, it's it's right out of that movement path. Uh, the This bottom instep strap that you're onto here was a, a big thing. And it was relatively, I mean, it looks relatively simple, like most things eventually end up looking, but this wasn't all that obvious. This took a lot of work. Um, basically... Again, I tried a lot of different systems on other gaiters, so I really liked how cord worked. It would nestle up into the lugs on your footwear. You wouldn't feel it on the trail, but it wears out so fast. Even like the best cords wear out super fast. I was buying like really expensive Dyneema. Yeah, like a woven. Yeah, 
like yeah. a woven cordage. Yeah, or even okay. like Dyneema. That's right. like this. And I would we we could wear it out in like one trip down to the Colorado River and back in the Grand Canyon. No way. Yeah, Dyneema is like uh, formerly called Cuban fiber, I think, which is like the. It's all yeah. Really, what it all is is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene UHMWPE. It's all related. And uh, that stuff's super strong. Right. That's but, it's supposed to be like the strongest. But when you put it under tension, yeah, and you start putting it against sharp stuff, it it can wear out really quickly. Interesting. So that just like wasn't really cutting it. So at the time, there's also a, a so again, Dyneema is a great product, mm-hmm. fantastic for for what if as long as you use it the right way. Yeah. Um. On the flip side, there's another great product out there that's a, a tpu coated webbing it's called biothane and that stuff's really cool too uh it's super durable but i didn't like being able to feel that so i really like ultras for especially for trail running and i really like a lot of the modern running footwear has a, a sole that's flat they don't have a cutout for the arch you get into like boots and it's not so much of an issue um, but i could feel that that any sort of a thick coated webbing that I'd put under my shoe. Sure. Didn't like how it felt on a trail runner. So sure. that didn't solve that. Okay. And eventually I sort of realized, what am I doing? I, I designed hard goods my whole career so far. I can just design a part that does what I wanted to do. It was sort of a weird thing that should have been obvious. Yeah. And so basically I designed a piece that's like a cord here in the middle, but it's made from TPU this is super similar to what's been on the nano spikes, right? Mm-hmm. And it was like, well, I already know a good material that works here. And then I ramp it up to a, a rectangular profile that has some adjustability here on the sides. And I uh, went through dozens of iterations with this uh, through 3D printing and stuff like that, trying it out. And eventually, yeah, I'm super stoked with this whole system. This is adjustable easily replaceable people don't really wear these things out these instep straps yeah i've seen people wear them out after like you could wear them out after like 700 really really rough miles like danny wore a set out Mm -hmm. but that is extremely rugged Mm -hmm. more so we have a thousand mile warranty on these straps that's proving out to be just fine like i i really only know a couple people who have really worn them out and around that mileage. Yeah. And the awesome thing is you can just replace this in seconds without any tools. So like say a through hiker is going to be using these gaiters. They could have a pair of these straps if they're worried about it, that they could replace partway through their trip and they can do it. No tools in seconds. It's, right. it's, it's really great. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, uh, I thought that, I thought that I'd be able to feel it. Yeah. I did think that when I saw it the first yeah. time around and I've never, I've never felt it on all the shoes. And the one thing that I do find really valuable about the Gators is the versatility to move around shoes. Yes. Yeah. Like to go back and forth from my running shoes. Like I had them on the ultras. I had them on the Hoka's. Now I can run them on my, um, my bike shoes. Uh, and I have like the boa on, on my bike shoes, yep. the boa lacing system. Mm-hmm. And it's got like a Velcro strap on the toe near the toe box. And it works for those too. Mm-hmm. I just hooked the front hook to the, to, to, to the, uh, that Velcro piece, even though it doesn't have any laces. Yeah. So it's just like, I didn't have to mess around with buying a different pair of gaiters or whatever. Exactly. So really pretty cool there. And you make, I, I've seen, I haven't, um, I don't have a pair of the, there was like a very robust version, right? With Gore-Tex. Yep. It's mm-hmm. like a full length. What is the, or, it's taller, or it's yeah. taller, yeah. Mm-hmm. What's the application on that? So whenever you need something that's going to be waterproof, um, these are, these are really great with water resistance. Mm-hmm. But when you need something that's really going to keep you dry, the Navigator and the Levigator are Gore-Tex and they'll keep you dry all day. Mm -hmm. Um, That's really, when you get into needing something waterproof is really when you'd make the switch. I see. I, I, for what I do, I utilize the stretch woven ones a lot more, but there's a lot of people that live in those climates where they need to keep their feet dry and it's super wet. I mean, we're in Arizona. We don't really have that going on, yeah. but those people really love those gators. And we do make a, 
a shorter levigator that people, when people find it, they're like, oh, this gator is really great. It's not super tall, but it keeps me dry and it's really minimal. That's cool. Cool. Oh yeah. And the other design piece of this is you have a, on a, like an elastic pull strap here Mm -hmm, at the top, at the top to somewhat cinch it down. But I've found that you can over cinch it for sure. Yeah. And, um, just needs to be barely snug. Yeah. Just enough to keep all the, all the stuff out. Yep. So pretty cool. And these come in different sizes, different sizes, heights and colors. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And we do have like this one you have is the instigator. It is super lightweight. I really love the skater. We also have a, a very lightweight, but a little bit more durable gator called the Renegator. So depending on what people are after and their preference for their gear, a little bit of something for everybody. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. So, um, let's get back to backpacking and bikepacking. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the, the coolest backpacking trip you remember? One of the coolest places you've gone to? Uh, right before I started working at Catula, we went with my, my dad has always wanted to go to this place called Elves Chasm. And like, like Elf, like, yep. Pointy eared Elf. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. And it's relatively difficult to get to on foot. There's not a lot of people that go down there on foot. There's a short rappel that's required. And most people access it from the river on like river trips. Where's it at? It's in the Grand Canyon. Okay. Yep. So uh, on top of that, even to get down, there's like some significant route finding going on to even first off get from your car to the right spot on the rim and then from the rim to get down there's a very tricky spot to find that makes or breaks the route. So um, that was just a super cool trip. You go down to Royal Arch. This arch is huge. You, uh, I, I think it was Harvey Butchard or somebody said you could probably like land a helicopter on top of this thing. It's huge. I'm wow. not sure. I'm not positive it's him that said it, but yeah, whoever said it was correct. The arch is massive. It's wow. really impressive. Uh, so I think that was one of the, the cooler trips I've done. That was just really, I think maybe part of it was that my dad has, has had always wanted to go down there. And it was funny. Eventually my brother and I asked him, well, why haven't you gone down there? And then we start to realize, oh, there's like kind of a lot of things involved. And my dad has never been like a climber. So he, we figured out that, that actually, I'm starting to remember that was my gateway into the climbing. Okay. Was getting my dad down there and starting to realize I enjoyed the rope work. Yeah. That was actually the gateway. That's right. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The technical aspect of the yep, rope work. It was. Yeah. Uh, but, but that trip, I mean, that destination itself is cool, but we had some kind of epic moments on that too. I mean, we were camped at this beach called Toltec beach and we were just in this epic, epic storm, like wind, rain. Like I remember being huddled in a little tent with my brother And it was just like, oh man, it is absolutely coming down out Mm -hmm. here. And we're in like the, like middle of the nowhere in the Grand Canyon. And it was just like, man, good thing all this stuff works. (laughs) No cell service? (laughs) No, not even close. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Not even close. Super remote. Yeah. Haven't seen people in a while. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's an, that's, that right there is a very interesting moment. Yeah. You're describing. I've had those moments too uh, with my dad. Yeah. And, um, you're kind of freaked out. I mean, if you're not a seasoned person that's been doing that a lot and been in those situations a lot, especially if you're a little younger, yeah, you're kind of like, is this going to work out okay? Yeah. And in hindsight, it may be, well, at the time, sometimes those trips aren't like very enjoyable, maybe even sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. But then you look back at them and you're like, wow, that was special. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that night I think was probably one of those for me. It was like, man, that was an impressive storm. Luckily, we had like the right gear. I mean, luckily we brought a tent with double vestibules on that trip for my brother and I. Sure. And it it honestly made that much more enjoyable to have a place to have our gear and be able to be dry and cook and all that stuff because otherwise it would have been miserable. Sure. Miserable. Yeah. I was on a trip with my dad and uh, his dog, uh, like a fairly large size uh golden retriever 
and we did um, the they were called like the Highland Lakes or something. They were in Colorado. Mm-hmm. You we so we drove to Silverton. So you're already kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And then you hike up from Silverton up to these lakes that are all above treeline. First cool. day was amazing, right? There was fishing. Like there oh, were a yeah. couple of lakes that didn't freeze all the way through. And the first day was incredible, but we were planned to be out there, I think three or four days and the storm started to roll in and we had a big Agnes seed house SL2, mm-hmm. which is like an ultralight two person tent. Yep. With one vestibule. Oh, yeah. And it was me and my dad and the dog. Oh. <laughs> above tree line in this thing for like two days. Oh, man, that's rough. So what you're saying, I'm like envious of your story where you had two vestibules, right? Well, from then on out, I told myself, and I've stuck to this, I was like, I'll never have, I'll never bring a tent that that doesn't have a one-to-one person to vestibule ratio. Okay. <laughs> Very wise. It literally changed my, like permanent opinion on that. Sure. Yeah, because you can cook in there. I mean, we were like, all of us were in this tiny tent and we were trying to do all of that oh, stuff in this little so vestibule. Hard. All of our gear was in there because there was no place to keep it, to keep it dry. Yeah. And that turned into one of those trips where like, I look back at it very nostalgically, right? Yeah. But, uh, but at the time I was not having fun. Mm-hmm. Like the first day was cool, but then the rest was like, oh my God. And then when the storm cleared, it was good, you know? Yeah. And now I kind of like weirdly seek out those situations <laughs> right? <laughs> as an adult. You yeah. Know? It's funny how that comes full circle. Yeah. So uh, what are the, what I'm interested to know about what one, what, what's one piece of technology that, or one piece of gear, sorry, one piece of gear that I guess both backpacking and bikepacking specific, you pretty much wouldn't live without, you couldn't live without on a trip. Oh man, that's a really interesting question. So it's very fascinating because the answers probably changed for me over years and sports. Mm -hmm. And now the answer is sun protection for me has become super critical. That's like the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, I'm 38 years old and I've already had to have some spots like frozen off my face. I'm super sun sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, especially living in Arizona pretty much my whole life. Mm -hmm. So sun protection has become like a huge thing for me now. And luckily that clothing has come so far. So like no matter what trip I go on now, the, it's always a sun hoodie has to be in the kit for sure. Mm -hmm. The other thing is just funny. I found, I think this is starting to, well, we'll see how long this stays an answer for me, but I always, I also like to get a good night sleep. So I've always tried to have like a comfortable sleeping pad and bag. Um, what do you use for pad? I used to use a big Agnes pad and I, that thing was super comfortable for sure. An insulated air core. Mm-hmm. I recently switched to a Nemo pad because it was literally like half the volume. And luckily it's been pretty comfortable so far. A tensor, insulated tensor. Is it? Is it like that foil? Is it loud? It, it, luckily, it's not loud. Okay. At least I don't find it to be loud, but it is the foil uh, insulation in that pad. I think that's why it's so small. Yeah. Yeah, because mm. I, I have a Neo Air. Uh, yeah. A Neo Air, I is think it, it loud? is. And it's so loud, it keeps me uh, up. So, so I sleep worse on that. I've been on trips with people with those. Yeah. And I I can't buy one i'll never be able to buy one of those i already sleep with earplugs in just to to try to sleep more soundly but those i can't have like a loud pad but the nemo doesn't doesn't seem to affect me with that cool and man i'm so it's interesting i have some sort of down allergy and okay started to figure out that i don't think it's just a general down allergy it must be like duck or goose or even how the down is treated so for a long time, it's really, really bizarre. Um, when when I do have the allergic reaction, it ends up in like me vomiting and like waking up super strange Whoa. respiratory issues. And if that happens to you once or twice, you tend to like run away from down because especially if you're in the back country, you yeah. do not want that going down. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> it even came to the point for a while where my dad would stop bringing uh, down bags on my trip. Or if we were in like a three-person tr- tent, like my brother would be in the middle in a synthetic bag and my dad would be on the other side from me. 
Luckily, actually, oddly enough, with this jacket, I met somebody from Patagonia at a trade show and I talked to them about this and they said, I've heard of this before. You should really try a, a down jacket from us. And they explained a bunch of stuff to me. And I was very skeptical because I was like, I don't want to be thrown up if I'm wearing this jacket. Yeah. And he yeah. said, get a jacket through me. And if, if it makes you sick, I'll take it back. Like no risk here involved. And this guy was super cool. So I took him up on it and I literally got this jacket and it was like, okay, this is not making me sick. So then I decided to borrow a down bag from my dad. He, he had bought a newer uh, Big Agnes bag. And I slept on it like on like the sofa or something with like a bucket next to me just in case. And I was like, woke up in the morning like, oh, I didn't get sick from this bag. This this guy was right. Wild. So this has changed everything for me. And yeah, I I I got super stoked because down is so much better for so many situations. Right. Sure. And uh, yeah, I. I then I got a Western mountaineering bag and that bag is so comfortable. So I I feel like like on this last trip, I just slept like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> and I the more I've used that bag, oh man, it's like a game changer. It's yeah. it's like luxuriously ultra light. Like well, that bag's not even really ultra light, but I got that bag for the comfort. It's still a lightweight bag. Yeah. Uh, but man, I just sleep like a baby in it. Yeah. So sleeping, I prioritize in sun protection. Yeah. Yeah, the the um, sun protection, the hoodie, the sun hoodie. I, I mean that that was something that I I'd seen people wear, and I never really yeah thought about it about how advantageous it is. Yeah, I used to just cover myself in sunscreen, and I don't know. I I do and I enjoy having the sun hoodie over being caked in sunscreen all day for sure. Still have to do that with my face and anything Same. that's exposed, but. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel a lot better in that. And then at the end of the day, you can take it off and put it back on the next morning. Yeah. And I've actually found the, um, I have the outdoor research. I forget the, uh, model mm -hmm. of it, but it's, it's super light. It's, it's yeah. Yours is really light. Yeah. Seven ounces or uh, four ounces. Maybe it's extremely light. Um, it also works as a really good layer for a cold. Yeah. It's, it's surprising how versatile it is. Yeah. Um, not on its own. Like if you just wear it on its own, it, you get very cold. But if you put another layer on top of it, if you make it as a, uh, do it as a mid layer, I mean, yeah. it adds like it reflects and just adds it's, it's great. So it's really versatile in that way. But yeah, the sun thing is interesting living in Arizona. That's a problem for us for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, caking on sunscreen and then doing multi-day trips. And it just being a mixture of sweat and dirt and sunscreen. Yeah, it turns into just this gunk. Yeah. Yeah. Not fun. No. So it's nice to be able to do do the sun hoodie. I also used it a lot to I, I would I would wet it and put it back on. Yeah. And it would be like a radiator for me mm -hmm. on Arizona Trail Race. And that was a game changer with the extreme heat this year. That's a good point. So yeah, that's a huge one. Um what about technology? What's your Technology has evolved a lot since you probably first started getting into oh, yeah. outdoor uh, sports. What's, what's your, do you embrace it? Yeah, I like to have a little bit of a balance. So it's funny, my dad was a really, I think a really early GPS adopter. So I've kind of been exposed to that for a while. Yeah. Uh, the funny thing is through backpacking, like I had a really old model E-Trex that he got me and I liked it and I used it but I didn't rely on it a whole lot. Like it was useful, mm -hmm. but I don't know so much with the backpacking for some reason I would really get to understand my route before I even left. Like I'd, I'd spend a lot of time with maps understanding, okay, I'm going to see this here. I'm going to see this here. Um, like on that trip I talked about earlier, we actually, there's a few side canyons and we were a little paranoid about, going losing our way on the way back up we actually just brought marker flags and we placed them and we picked them up on our way out and no one else is on that route so we didn't have to worry really too much about that yeah so we we found pretty low tech ways to do it the funny thing is with the bike packing it's totally different for me like i got an e-track a newer e-tracks and it's come a long way i'll tell you that yeah um 
I don't know about the newest, newest one, the solar one. It looks like it went backwards. Yeah, in. it sure does. <laughs> Maybe. So I have a 32X, I think is the model. Right. Yeah. And uh, man, so for the bike packing, it's weird. I don't want to think about turns and routes quite as much. I think I, I'm starting to focus more on the endurance aspect and less on the route finding aspect. Yeah. It's weird. I guess I'm, I'm realizing just talking through it route finding and figuring that stuff out and being prepared for the route is much more a a backpacking and hiking thing in my head at the moment. Whereas like the biking, I like to have the technology. I do, especially it's right there on your handlebars. You just look down and if I'm on my line, I'm good. Yeah. Um, so that e-trex has been great. I really like having, and it's funny, I guess maybe part of that is as I'm getting a GPX file ready, I probably am learning more about the route than I'm realizing. And it's more subconscious yeah. learning. That's probably part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then I can tell you though, like my wife's favorite thing is the inReach. <laughs> right. Because she gets check-in messages from me. She knows all is good. I can send them without cell service. And then if I have an emergency, I either can hit that button or I can text her what's going on. And that's been a nice it probably is a nicer comfort for me than I even realize being able to send those and knowing I do have that, yeah. but, but it's made it a lot easier on my, like my family, basically like my whole family checks that thing when I'm out and they, they like knowing where I am and that all as well. Sure. It's, it's an insurance policy. Yeah. That's the way I look at the spot and the end reach. Yep. Would you still do this stuff if that tech was, if the, if the, if push a button, call a helicopter wasn't available? I would because I've done it before. Yeah. Yeah. But they wouldn't feel so good about it. Would you spend more time planning? Yeah, and communicating that plan. Yeah. That's exactly what I used to do. You'd say- I'm I'd a- even say like, look, if it's not going well, this is going to be my plan. So if you, if I don't show up, don't only check the route here. I might have tried to go this way. I would actually tell people that. I, I'd have pretty detailed things that I was going to- plan on doing and my b and c plans that would be left with somebody yeah for sure sure yeah that's kind of an old school uh that's a thing you did like yes. backpacking i remember my dad taught me that like, exactly you let all these people know about all the you know these intricacies and you plan and it's all about the pre-planning yeah and you're losing some of that <sighs> there's definitely a reliance on tech now yeah um but man now that i have that in reach and it's so small Mm-hmm. It's so tiny. I have the inReach Mini. It's a rechargeable? Yeah. And it lasts forever. If you just send manual check-ins, it lasts forever. Um, I actually haven't really backpacked since I got that thing. I didn't get it that long ago. I've done some longer day hikes where I've actually brought it, but I'll I'll bring that backpacking now. Just why not? Like, for sure. If you have that and it's so easy, you're already paying for the subscription on it. Uh, that'll that'll go on every backcountry trip I go on now for sure. Maybe not the e-trex, but the inReach will. Yeah, it's so. Handy. I wonder how long it's going to be until the phones take over that technology. It can't be that far away. I mean, they're doing the SOS mode on the iPhone is free yep. right now for a short period of time, and then they were toying with the idea of making it a pay service. I don't think it is yet. Yeah, but all it's got to you know the other phone manufacturers just need to get onto that network. Well, the funny thing is just a few days ago, that setting popped into Android phones Okay, and someone discovered it. So it's, it's becoming. So they are doing a similar SOS type thing for Android. They're getting there. It's not actually working yet. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, that's, that's going to take it over. Right. And one of the other things I was thinking about was the, um, I have a, um, I have a Garm. I just got the Garmin 1040 solar. Yeah. I, I never said I was going to leave the e-trex because of the two batteries, you know, the battery situation, you can, it's you can so replace good. them. You can carry extra batteries. They last forever. And I did some math and I looked at what I'm going to do with my different routes and the distances and the times and the resupply points for like the type of routes I'm going to ride and race. And I decided to go with the 1040. Mm-hmm. It has a built in, um, tracking feature. Uh, I forget Garmin live track or oh, something is what it's yeah. called. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying. I'm I'm looking out and seeing when is when is this stuff going to all go down into one device? Mm-hmm. So I no longer have to carry an inReach or a eTrax, right? Because it's all going to be on my one bike computer. Right? And so this is something I've wondered about as well. And I'm probably 
oddly a late adopter, I guess, with this, which is surprising for me. Yeah. Um, I so I had I didn't buy this stuff that long ago, and I had the option to buy like an all in one in reach. Uh, what do they call it? Like a sixty six i or something. And I thought about the phone thing, and it's funny. So if I'm out if I'm out on the trail and my phone dies with my current setup, all I've lost is my photo taking ability. Right. And my podcast or music. Right. I specifically decided to keep my inReach separate, separated from everything else. And I don't know if I regret, I don't think I regret that at this point in time. I like the fact that even if my nav dies and my phone dies, I can hit that button. I really like that. Yeah. Redundancy. Yeah. You, you have built in, when it comes to safety, how much redundancy do you want? Yep. How much of a single point of failure do you want? Yeah. And that's where I get very uh, detailed with what how I think about stuff, and pretty I'm pretty particular anyway. Yeah, but, um, yeah, that was a really conscious decision I made. Yeah, and then I started realizing the same things, like oh yeah, like I don't have to take a big device now if I want to take this. This inReach is so tiny, I won't hesitate to clip it on my backpack if I go backpacking with this. Yeah. Whereas if it's like a big mapping device i might hesitate to take it backpacking yeah so i'm at the point right now where i'm like keeping those things separate and we'll see how long i i stay in that camp but i'm i'm actually pretty stoked with my decision at the moment yeah but i think you're right that a lot of people are gonna a lot of people are gonna go for that if that makes it into a phone it's gonna be perfect i'll bring my phone and a power bank and call it good yeah yeah it's real uh it's really, really scary for me to think about. I have one device. It, well, okay. First of all, it's really yeah. great because as as a as a bike packer, uh, race racer, Minimum. every time I look, I'm looking at less is more. Let's have multiple. Yeah. One thing uh, serves four purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's all about weight and space and speed. Yeah. So yeah, awesome. You only have one device now, but the double edged sword. You you crash you break that you device now device. everything's gone <laughs> yeah. right so I don't think I don't think I'll ever go away from when it comes to safety and I so I I know I walked back on the e trex thing um, but when it comes to safety I don't think I'm ever gonna not have redundancy yeah I, I would love to have a spot that I could lose that's strapped to my backpack and I could lose it uh, and I still have the SOS on my phone. I you know? agree. That would be the best setup. Yeah. To have a redundancy like that. Yeah. I mean, I do redundancy on my twist ties on my spot, you yeah. know, because I twist tie the spot to different spots on my back. Yeah. Back. So I have like two layers of redundancy. So if it does come, if the Velcro fails on the spot, a twist tie catches it. If that twist tie fails, the third twist yep. tie catches that, right? I have my in reach mounted on my handlebar so I can send the check ins. Again, I'm just doing it manually on the hour. Yeah. Um, and I am the same thing. I have that mount is rock solid. I have crashed over the bars and that thing's been fine. Yeah. It's still clipped on a tether with a carabiner, a small carabiner. Right. I'm like this. I don't want to lose this. Right. It's yeah. The same thing. Yeah. The tether is key. <laughs> um, I, I was trying to figure out, uh, I had a light, uh, the Phoenix BC 36 R mm-hmm. and it doesn't come with any kind of tether attachment. I was like, having a panic attack about it <laughs> and it, i had some like duct tape system going on where i like duct taped a loop in there so i could at least do a thing but yeah um yeah it, it's all it's always about that what about um water filtering what do you use i've toyed with different things uh well this is a very timely question so okay. back in the day with my dad we'd use a ketodyne pump okay. you know and yeah. that thing was a lot of work a lot of physical work to, to filter water. Was it like one of those um, clay or sand or, or yeah cores that goes in? Yeah, you have the right idea. Yep. Yeah. And that it worked really well, though. It did work really well. And we could you could easily disassemble it to clean it. And we would have to do that because we filtered a lot of Colorado River water yeah. with that. Right. Uh, so then eventually, when all of these inline gravity type filters started coming out, I, I finally got a Sawyer Mini. And I've used that for a while. And I know a lot of, there's a lot of mixed reviews about that thing. Um, like the flow rate is horrible. Yep. The flow rate's <laughs> slow. That being but said, it's tiny. It's tiny. Yeah. And 
I, I'm maybe a little more patient because I'm used to pumping that thing from when I was a kid. Yeah. But I was like, oh, this filter is fantastic yeah. because I'm not sitting there pumping it. Um, and I had like some homemade systems with that I put that into a gravity setups where I just ate a snack while my water was filtering and I was done anyway. Right. But I'm not doing race pace here. Right. So that being said, I didn't expect it to freeze on this last trip and that filter probably froze. Mm -hmm. So now I'm in the position of replacing it. And I have, it must be a sign that I didn't think I'll just drive to the store and buy another Sawyer Mini. Because now I'm like, okay, what should I replace this with? So I know you've had a good experience, I think, with the Katadyne. Is it the Katadyne or the Solomon? Yeah, I ended up with the Solomon. Which I think might be the Katadyne filter element. I can't remember. Yeah, they're, well, they're actually all the same technology. They're all the hollow, hollow they're all fiber. called like hollow fiber. Yeah. Or where, hollow tube or something. Yeah. And so if you open up the Sawyer, it looks just like yeah. the Katadyn and the um, uh, Solomon. Yeah, uh, but it has more surface area, so it's faster. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. So the the tubes are a little different, but they um, they are also on those two devices. They're also um, open, so like they're not enclosed like on the Sawyer. Yeah, which means you don't have to back flush them. The Sawyer, you have right. to bring a a different syringe and stick it in and back flush it. Yes. On those other two, it's open. So you can actually just like swish it, swish around. it around in the water and it, it, that's how you clean it. I gotcha. Um, so it's less stuff to bring. Yeah. Like in my mind, that's a, it was a superior product. Um, that's a good point. Jess, Jess got it for Cocodona and then I started using it because I was kind of into the Sawyers as well. Mm -hmm. Not the mini, the bigger one, because it had a better flow rate. The squeeze? Yeah, the Sawyer squeeze. Yeah, I've read good things about that. The problems I had with the Sawyer were the bags. I kept wearing holes through the bags. Yeah. Like the foil Every, bags. Everybody hates the bags. Yeah. And I bought, I bought uh, different bags to use with my mini that are good, Seanock. Okay. They're like a small brand. And they have like a, a zip style opening on one end and a screw on the other. Okay. So they're versatile bags and I like those things. Um, I just started using those very recently, but they're yeah. really good. It's imagine like a, a water bladder type bag mm -hmm. with those features on it. Okay. But now I'm in this position too. Yeah. Where I'm wondering, should I try something different? Yeah. The only downside of the, of those Katadyne ones for me is if I go backpacking, I do like to have a gravity setup for around camp. Yeah. It's unbeatable. You put dirty water in the top and you almost have like running water at the bottom. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'm into the, the territory now where I need to have both in my kit. They run it. They have inline filter adapters. Oh, do they? Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can have like a bladder. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Or you could have like a dirty bladder. You could carry a, a clean water bladder and a dirty water bladder or something like that, that you could run up. See, that'd make it worth it. You could run an inline filter because the idea is you could actually fill up your camelback with dirty water. Right. And then you have the inline filter and you're just sucking on fresh water there. So you're exactly. actually just filtering it as you drink it. Yeah, so yeah. that would be the approach to that. Yep. Um, the Sawyer bags I replaced with, I actually found that smart water bottle, smart water bottles that you could buy at gas stations. So that's what I was using too. Yeah. Even on my, in my bike bag, like mm -hmm. in my stem bags. They thread up to it. So it adapts to beautifully. it. Beautifully. And yeah. those bottles are lightweight and so tough. And yep, they're super durable. You can find them anywhere. So if you lose yours, you can pick one up. That's what I've used the most with my mini before it froze is the Sawyer bottles. Yeah. And real quick, I want to talk about why it's a problem when it, when it froze, when it oh, freezes. Yeah. So from my understanding, the way these filters are made is they have these tiny little fibers, but they're like tubes. Think yep. of them like straws. They're literally tiny tubes. And they have like a ton of little micro holes along the sides. Yep. And when you put water through it and apply pressure to it, it will push the water through those holes and leave any kind of the bacteria or giardia or cryptosporidium. Yep. That's the vocabulary word of the day. Yep. Uh, inside of the filter. Yeah, that's the literal filtering part. Right. Exactly. And so what happens when they freeze, if there's water in it, when it freezes, it actually opens because water expands as it freezes. It actually opens those holes up slightly they get on bigger. the inside. Exactly. You were the first one to tell me about this. And, uh, and you can't see it. And you can't see it if it's a problem, so you can't tell if it's compromised. And, and it's binary. Either it's okay or it's not. Right. There's no... 
there's no gray area. So if you've used the filter and there's water in it and you get down to somewhere around 32 or 30 degrees and you don't have it on your body inside your sleeping bag or whatever. Yep. Um, there's a chance that if you use it again, those, uh, crypto and giardia whatever's going to make you sick is going to be able to get through the holes and make you sick exactly. on a future trip yeah. right and there's not a really good reliable way to tell if your filter has been compromised there are some methods that they say you can try but man at that point like is it really worth trying to figure that out when you're in the back country and you get sick have you ever had have you ever gotten sick you ever no. had giardia or anything luckily no me neither but my well, I don't think so. My dad thinks he's had some bad experiences that have have affected him in the backcountry for sure. Yeah, and his just hearing about that from him is enough to make me not want to chance it. Like, if there's a chance that filter froze, I'm just gonna go buy another one. Like, yeah, they're thirty bucks or whatever. Yeah, you know? they're made. They're kind of disposable. I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've heard people. I did that video on this, and I had some comments about people were like, "I never filter water. Oh, I'm not, I've never man. been sick." And I was like, okay, if you if you are in Colorado or wherever and you have like these beautiful springs everywhere, okay, and you're high up and you know there's no cattle, yep. Then then okay, probably, right? But like in Arizona, yeah. the water is almost always miserable. Everybody's going to have different experiences based on where they live, right? Yeah. Like you're saying, you can that is not a good idea out here. Yeah, I had people make fun of me for filtering. Well, not really make fun of me, I guess. When I put out my Iceland video, people were like, why'd you lock your bike up in Iceland? <laughs> <laughs> they were like, seriously? Uh -huh. You locked your bike up in Iceland? There's like one murder a year or whatever. Like the right. crime is so low. Um, and then the other thing, people were like, I, I guess nobody really said it, but it was the two things I questioned on that trip. One was... One was the bike lock and two was like the water filtering. Yeah. Because it's like, this is coming from a glacier. But there were like sheep everywhere. So it, it's like, why? It's this tiny piece in your exactly. kit. Exactly. Why are you going to, why are you going to risk having diarrhea and throwing up for the next three days? Ex I'm 100% on board with what you're saying. On a trip that costs that much money and that, that many resources. Yeah. You know? And it's not that hard to filter water. Right. And it's not that hard to like put a little lock on your bike. Yeah. Like what would it, what would have happened if my bike did disappear? Yeah. The one criminal in Iceland decided to steal my bike that day, right? Yeah. I, the whole trip would have been pointless because I was there to bike. Yeah. Right? Exactly. I flew there with my bike to bike. So, um, so the water filtering thing is, you know, and I've even heard people, I've heard Leal uh, Wilcox say that she, you know, doesn't filter water every time. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, okay, I don't know. I, I just, I, I wonder if she's gotten sick and I know Dana's gotten Giardia oh, and he was man. messed up for, I don't know, months. Yeah. It's not to be taken lightly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I've, I, you know, um, I've drank out of some pretty nasty stuff, but it kind of goes back to that technology thing. Uh, like what, what yeah. kind of skills, where do you fall on like your map wayfinding skills, right? Like old school, I'm going to know which way is a, is the right direction because of the way the sun comes up mm -hmm. or like which side the moss grows on. Isn't that one way? Yeah. <laughs> is well, that real? <laughs> I've kind of cheated too, because a lot of my backpacking experience has been in the Grand Canyon mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong. It's easy to get lost there but there's a nice river that flows in one direction all the time. Yeah. And that's you it's it's an amazing kind of uh you know thing to have in your head of like okay, I know basically which way is which from this. Yeah. But oh, don't get me wrong, it's it's not hard to get lost in side canyons and all sorts of ways there. Have you had that moment where you think you're lost? I have not, but I know plenty of people who have had bad experiences. Yeah. I'm luckily not in that, but probably through other people's experiences, I was, I've been able to avoid having my own. Yeah. I've had times where I started to wonder if I was, but I wasn't. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a moment in super, the superstitions. Oh, that is a whole different thing. That is, it's easy to get lost out there in my mm -hmm. opinion. Well, people do all the time in it's Phoenix. People go crazy with one water bottle thinking that they're going to be fine or whatever. Yeah. And you go 
five miles back and it's like a whole different world oh it's insane yeah and we we were it was like a group of us college friends and we we didn't have gps or anything and we were going off of paper maps and routes and we got kind of in this spot where we had to make a decision you know yep and we had to make a a a skills-based decision based on our knowledge of where we thought we were without any sort of like technology to help us out you know yep and it could, it, I remember it being a moment where I was like, this could be really bad and I have to be really diligent about my decisions right now. Yeah. Because I'm going to end up on the news or whatever if I don't make a good decision right here. Yeah. So, and it was scary. Um, and I think about that bike packing. Like, I have this one track that I'm following and it's so simple and it's so nice and it's just like, follow this track, right? That goes away. Yeah. I guess, yeah. I, I have done redundancy now that I'm thinking it through. So when I do the GPX track on my E-Trex, yeah. I do put that into Garmin Explorer and I have that on my phone. Okay. So, so you have that a is a backup. Yeah. Yep, so sure. I do, yeah, I do similar ride with GPS. I'll download an offline map. Yep. Exactly. And uh, just in case I break Backups, my, man, yeah. yeah, but you don't, the, the you know, I thought about that scenario. You have to like check your phone every 10 seconds or whatever if you don't know where you are it sucks but at least you'll you'll be all right you know what i mean so um what do you uh what do you got coming up that you want to do for trips um it's funny not all of it's bikepacking related i really want to i'm going to start learning some pack rafting i've never really done like a lot of boating in general i have a ducky Hmm. But I haven't even used it a whole lot. It, but it's been really fun whenever I have used it. Uh, so I'm going to actually go with Danny and his partner Miriam and do some pack rafting here soon and start learning the ropes on that. Cool. That should be really fun. And then generally, though, bikepacking is still the focus. I want to just... I haven't done that many bikepacking trips. I, I want to to really just start getting out and enjoying more of that here this year. Yeah. You. What are the races or the rides you've done? The routes? Uh, the very first one was with you and Tyler out Woody Mountain Road. Oh, into the world. Yep, that yeah. was actually super fun. Yeah, and we had every a little bit of everything on that trip. It just that storm was something else. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Man, so that storm was something. else. Yeah, <laughs> um, and that was the trip where I literally was like, okay, Chris is an expert outdoorsman. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah there, we we rode all the way out it wasn't very far it was me you and yeah, tyler it was like 30 miles one way on dirt roads yeah and there was a, there was an epic storm coming in yeah and we it was an epic storm yeah it was like we talked to the person at the lookout tower yep and she was like there's two massive storm cells clashing together and she was like super excited yeah, and she, uh, was. she was super into it. It was like, <laughs> yeah, this is like winning the lottery for her. And the, the rain had chased us all day, right? Mm-hmm. From my house. It was coming from every direction yeah. except for where we were. Yeah. Uh, from your house. Yep. And we, we got out there and then we were like, we, you and you and I were taking our sweet time trying to find the perfect mm-hmm. <laughs> camp spot. We had camp spot <laughs> paralysis <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. Yep. Where we're like, eh, I don't know. That's not flat enough. Yeah. It's or like the, a, the trees are kind of. I see a rock over there. <laughs> yeah, there's a rock over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tyler's like, man. Yeah, and meanwhile, this storm is just like getting darker it's and closer yeah. and descending on us. And we're just like, ta ta da ta da ta da Let's find our spot. And we finally find a spot. And it starts to kind of sprinkle a little bit. It is literally as soon as we stopped, it really did. And Tyler, um, God bless him. It's the first time that he set up his tent. A new tent, right? New tent. Yeah. And it had like, like you needed like your associate's degree to set this tent up. <laughs> yeah, it was bit. like this X thing, this this crossover thing with this weird, and we were like reading the instructions and me and him. Actually, I was kind of spectating, yeah. to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, and the storm's coming and he's starting to panic a little bit more. And, you know, I, I just have this lens and I'm just, just the kind of like watching Tyler and I'm not, meanwhile, I'm not setting up any of my stuff <laughs> like, cause I'm just kind of being entertained and I look over to you and you're like standing there. You got your arms crossed. You're just like looking at your setup. Cause you look like, pretty good. <laughs> it just went up. Like yeah. basically you just did it on its own. And that was our first trip. And I was like, Oh, he, 
obviously has a base skill for this. Like he's been doing this a while, right? Yeah. And uh, and Tyler, we, we you you come you come help him, and we get the his tent all figured out, like just in the nick of time. And then like the sky opens up, and I'm rushing to put my tent up. And uh, yeah, and it, it it rained for I don't know a couple hours. And pretty good. loud thunder, and yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. And then it cleared out, and we had a good good night that it, night. It really did work out. Yeah, yeah. So that was my very first one. After that was when I did the I did the North Rim trip with the Rainbow Rim Trail back up on the AZT with my really good friend Eric. Yeah, and that was I'd say like my real first. Like we that was a fun trip that we had, but it was relatively straightforward. Mm-hmm. Eric and I were out there in it. And we had all sorts of trail magic going on on that trip. Yeah, that's a uh, notoriously uh, spotty for water. Oh, right. The, the water situation's difficult. Right. Yeah. Even though you're like in the forest and it feels like there should be water everywhere, there's like none. Yeah. There's one spring. <laughs> One's, yeah. And we were hoping that that was going to be reliable. And we just, right. I mean, Eric was pretty much running out of water. And we met this really awesome couple that was out in this camper Mm -hmm. and we had seen them earlier that day at the at the north end of the rainbow rim trail they were surprised to catch us at the south end and they're like we can't believe you guys rode all that do you guys need anything and we're like man we could use some extra water and they're like oh we have 44 gallons of water come in and fill up and they filled every bottle we had to the brim we didn't even have to filter any super lucky trail magic but once again on that trip eric and i woke up on the last morning and it was Oh, there was an even more epic storm that chased us all day. Yeah. And we narrowly outran it. And on the way home, we drove through it. Uh, man, it was it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, uh, so let's see. I rode like a kind of a miniaturized version of the Queen's Ransom after that. Okay. Um, From Superior kind of rode counterclockwise and ended at Hawes with Eric and two of his friends from Pivot. Okay. That was super fun. That was when we had planned on doing the BCT. That was a last minute adjustment because the Agua Fria flashed. Right. It was like, there's no way we can cross it. It was like 19 feet. Yeah. Right. (laughs) That was after there was all the (laughs) snow melt up here. But that trip ended up being a total blast. We were like, yeah, we turned that into like a party trip. It was really fun. Yeah. You know, they do a party pace group ride on that. Yeah. I think it was the same weekend I just did the BCT. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Schilling, John Schilling runs that. Yeah, and they do. Cool. I think they do it over like four or five days. Yeah, so it's a very like casual, uh, fun ride. Yep. Yeah. So then some smaller stuff here and there. I did a solo trip from the South Rim. The plan was from the South Rim back to Flag. I ended up getting a pickup at Forest Road. Uh, what is it? Four eighteen. Yeah. Yeah. At the AZT right there. Yeah. That was my. That had been my longest day on the bike. Um. That was a hard day for me. Literally waking up at six in the morning. Actually, I wanted to start earlier, but I couldn't. It was absolutely frigid out. I had to stop like two miles in and like put my hands in my armpits. I couldn't even work the brakes. Rode all day into the, when it got dark and just ended up camping. And I think that was like 78 miles of AZT and I was spent. That was my, probably my hardest day on the bike for sure. Dang. Yeah. Which for me, that was quite my endurance accomplishment i learned a lot that day for sure yeah uh but it was cool yeah and then uh yeah craters and cinder cones bct yeah so still kind of entering into that whole thing still trying to figure out a lot with nutrition yeah it's really tricky are you interested in doing any races i don't know i'm not very fast well, are you interested in doing any group rides? <laughs> I'm not going to be winning. Any. Grand departs, I guess I'll call it, I think, races. I think it'd be cool to ride one of those races with the with the community kind of part for sure. Yeah. We'll find some other people that aren't racing it. and There's tons of people yeah, that it'd be cool. tour it. Yeah, it'd be and cool. And they do the grand depart For sure. You know? Yeah. I want to figure out the... I'm struggling with the nutrition part for sure. Yeah. Um, I think once I get that figured out, I'd have a bit more fun with other people out there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do liquid nutrition? I try to drink a lot of tailwind. Yeah. It works pretty well for me, but it's, it's weird. At some point I hit this point where it becomes really hard to take in enough calories Mm -hmm. and I need those calories and I, I'm telling myself I need them, but taking them in is, is difficult and I need to, to crack the code there. Yeah. I think Kurt, Kurt Ruff Snyder, 
his recommendation is 200 to 300 calories per hour. Yeah. Which if you've ever tried to do that. I've tried. It's extremely difficult. It's so hard. You have to be a competitive eater to basically do 300 calories. Yeah. And not get sick. Yes. Yeah. And even like when I ride with you and I wish I could eat as much at a stop as you can. Like, I yeah. feel like I need to like train for that. <laughs> it's like a good skill to be able to take in all those calories. I'm an addict. So like I have an addictive personality and I'm now <laughs> addicted to eating. So it's an advantage for bike packing yep. um, that I can eat that much and put down that many calories. But I've been actually transitioning out of that. Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to get better at the long, slow calorie intake. Yeah, I remember you kind of mentioning that. Because, yeah, I mean, I've yeah. done a couple stops where I've, you know, eaten 4,000 calories, 3,000 calories, and then I've gone and had to pedal up a giant mountain, and it's just not fun. Mm. It's, just, it's just not a good a sluggish. path. Yeah, yeah. It, just, it just sucks, you know. Yeah. So trying to show up to a resupply and not be completely starving that's what I've been trying to work on. Yeah, you know? that's when I know I'm doing well is when it, that happens and I'm not. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know you're in a good spot, you know. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let me uh, – let's take another break. Yeah. And I have a rapid fire segment. Oh, cool. Okay. And then uh, – so we'll take a quick break and come right back. Sounds good. And we're back. Yeah, we're back. Uh, so, so many people – I was just saying that so many people were, are, are distracted by their phone and that this – being locked into a conversation like this is, 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 seems rare these days. Totally does. Um, I've had this mixed relationship with social media. I know you only do Strava. That's it. Is this a active choice? What, what's oh, the yeah. reasoning behind this? For sure. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely joined Facebook in 2004, probably when you had to have like a college email address. Like a, an actual college email address like to join. Like a dot .edu? Yeah, and it's so different now. But yeah. <laughs> what? And at the time, it, it was actually pretty cool. I could like figure out um, how to like get in touch with people in classes that I had or find people that I wanted to ask about different projects or whatever. Mm -hmm. it was, and as soon as it started, um, I was never like super into it though. And I've always valued like much closer relationships rather than having a bunch of friends. So, yeah, I don't know what happened, but after being on there for a while, I just started to, before even a lot of people were talking about it, I was like, something doesn't feel genuine about this. Like, I don't feel like I'm connecting with my friends that I haven't seen for a long time by just like pushing a like button on their photo. Like, that's super just not doing it for me. Yeah. And then I started realizing this is what, what actually started to kill it for me, I think, was people started um, expecting that they could kind of get a hold of me through that. And it mm -hmm. was like, man, if you need me, like, just call me or text me. Like, this is how we've always operated. I don't know why Facebook has to be. And I'm just picking on Facebook here because that's what I was on. But yeah, um, at some point, I was like, I'm just going to straight up close this down. Like, I, I don't really get any enjoyment out of this. Like, if I want to so my, my friend, Eric, I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. I'll just call that guy on like a Tuesday night and we'll be on the phone for an hour and a half catching up because lives in North Carolina. Now I get so much more out of that than just trying to like see some, some photos that somebody posts or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I just found it was like unhealthy for me. It wasn't, wasn't like the real connection that I needed. I think all this stuff that people talk about, about you only see like the curated part of life is super true. Yeah. Yeah. It's destructive. I really end up connecting with Tyler on one of our rides talking about this because I think he, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he has a similar thing going on. Yeah. And yeah, like the Strava too. I, I actually do like Strava because it is connecting me with people that are doing what I'm doing. And then I end up talking with them about that. Yeah. Like, and actually talking with them, not through just the comments. Yeah. Strava has an entirely different business model. Strava is not ads based. Yeah. They have a subscription model. Yeah. And then they have a free model, but they don't advertise in it. When you're right, I see what my friends are actually doing. Yeah. And it's not edited or some algorithm telling me I should do that. Right. Right. They're, they are not in the business, as far as I can tell, of 
capturing your attention and reselling it as much as possible. Yeah. That, that these other platforms are in the business of. And that's why I'm okay, like philosophically, I'm okay with Strava. It definitely has this keep up with the Joneses feeling because yeah, you do see all your friends um, going out and doing these things and um, you kind of are like, Oh, I'm, I'm a slug. I need to go do that too. But, but man, if there's anything, if there's anything where that could be positive, I think it's exercise yeah. and activity. So if there's any keeping up with the Joneses, that's got to be the best one you can have. Totally. So that's, I think, why I'm okay with it. But yeah, aside from Strava, I'm not on literally zero social media for me. Yeah. And I do not miss it. I actually literally like that I don't have it. It makes me do other more worthwhile stuff. Yeah. (laughs) I thought about starting a cult at one point, uh, an (laughs) anti-social media cult. I'll join it. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I was going to be like, you know, we'd go have meetings and- You'd have to put your phones in bags and stuff like those, those bags that they do at like comedy shows. We started doing that with some friends. We used to go to dinner with them and everybody would put their phone on a stack on the table. That's that's a good idea. In the middle. And you weren't allowed to touch it until you left. It's a great idea. It was awesome. Yeah. I love podcasts because I love uninterrupted long form conversations where you're really locked in. Right. And I've. Yeah been listening to podcasts for a long time. I was like an early adopter and now doing it, being on the other side of it. Um, I'm very excited about being able to actually like connect with people in a different way. I think mountain bike riding was kind of like a gateway for that. Cause when you're riding bikes, you can't be on your phone and you can still talk. If you're climbing up a forest road or whatever, you can still talk with your friends. No doubt. Tyler and I catch up a lot just on rides. Yeah. It's kind of a social thing, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, it's the world though. That's the problem. The world is, is, uh, now being engineered around social media. It's so true. You know? And so where, where do we, where do we fit in on all this? Like, I feel like in order to promote this podcast, I have to be on Instagram to reach the audience. You know, I've asked my wife to manage it for me because I don't feel Mm. it's not, I can't handle it. Almost like accountability management for you. Yeah, like, I can't. Yeah, I can't keep it healthy. I, like, I can't handle. I got sucked in. Yeah. Like at first, it was. That's what they want. Yeah. <laughs> I don't they, mean to sound like a conspiracy theorist. No, but, you're not. But that is what they, they want. They spend that's billions of dollars. Literal business. In, yeah. Engineering it to suck you in and keep you in and yeah. take your attention, right? And I got my degree in advertising, and and like I I work in marketing, and so I understand kind of this like attention thing, and and it's it's kind of wild. Um, Mm -hmm. and I wish more people were aware of what was happening to them, but it does. Even, even I, who knew the business of capturing attention was captured Yeah, because that's how good they are. It it honestly really bothers me. It's, it's bothered me for a few ways. Like the personal ways are are some of these things. The other thing that really bothered, I have a, okay, probably everybody would say this, but I'll still say it. I I think I have a pretty finely tuned like BS detector. Yeah. And especially when you start getting, um, you know, they'll fig their algorithm will figure out, oh, this person likes outdoor gear. So now you'll start seeing like outdoor gear influencers and stuff. And I have watched those things change over the past decade or so. And I know a lot of it is fake straight up these people are not experts on what they're talking about Mm. i honestly think some people are giving bad advice um i can tell when somebody knows what they're talking about with with especially with outdoor gear was how i figured this out yeah you know if you spend a lot of time using stuff yourself talking to other people like you who actually i know are like literally you're in situations where you at some point your life depends on some of this stuff. Yeah. You're learning a lot. And like, there's people that are reviewing these products and they're just going out and using them for a little bit and presenting information. Like they know everything about it. Oh, it drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we have to, you know, we have an obligation to be the, the right side of that voice, you know? Yeah, exactly. So like if we let, if we let that take control, you know, um, there has to be another side to it. We, yeah. we have an obligation to do that. It's at least the way I look at it. It's very, very interesting. Who knows where it's going to go, you know, with social media. I mean, TikTok is the scariest thing for me. I'm not. I don't have it on my phone. I've never even been on it. 
but I've definitely seen clips and yeah, I, oh man, that, that platform in particular is just kind of bizarre how quickly it makes people want to act the same way they see other people act. Mm -hmm. It's really bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. There needs to be a social media that's all the worst side of people. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) Right. All the like bad days that people have. Because like you said, it's all the good days, yeah. right? It's and all the like best of the best. I've heard of people trying to do that and that that's intriguing to me, but I think it it's probably, not gonna, yeah. It's hasn't, not gonna sell ads. It hasn't worked as well as I think those good intention people did mean for it. Yeah, it's not going to generate money for anybody. Right. People want to see. <laughs> yeah, they're tapping into something that's so primal to mm-hmm. us. Um, so I don't know. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, jump into the rapid fire. All right. Questions. Oh, um, this is like my my weakness. I'm a talker. Okay. That's okay. I mean, you can make it shorter challenge. as long as you want. I have no time limit on my <laughs> rapid fire questions. It's just called rapid fire. All right. Uh, your favorite, uh, I would ca- call it wilderness food. So backpacking, bikepacking, whatever. What's oh, your favorite oh. food to bring and eat? Snickers. Snickers. Yeah. It's a hard call. If I have to, if I'm in a situation where I have to have a freeze dried meal, I actually do really like the mountain house uh spaghetti and meat sauce. But <laughs> but I know it's really odd, but it's actually I think it's actually pretty good. But Snickers bar still takes it. Yeah. Every time you eat one, it's just awesome. Yep. Yeah, the 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 freeze dried uh I think if you go with the stuff that's noodle based. That's the safe bet. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> like pad thai, <laughs> spaghetti meatballs. Yeah. But once you start getting into the other stuff, it gets a little dicey. Yeah, don't get too exotic. Yeah, super dicey. Yep. Snickers. What's your spirit animal? Oh, man. That's a really interesting question. Oh, man. I feel like somebody figured this out for me recently and I already <laughs> forgot what it was. Was it you? I don't know. Possibly. <laughs> I do kind of assign people spirit animals and I don't tell them. Oh, man. But I'm trying a different approach okay. where they can self-assign. <laughs> I, I'll give a not well thought out fire, uh, rapid fire answer. I'm starting to think it's the turtle or the, the desert tortoise because I am definitely more of a tortoise than a hare. I started thinking about that on the BCT with those signs for the, the tortoise. Oh, the tortoise mitigation signs? Yeah. <laughs> but it is true. I mean, you and Tyler were so awesome on that one trip where I was super tired on day two. Mm. And I wasn't in a bad mood. I wasn't grouchy. But I just, I could keep turning the pedals, but it was going to be slow. Mm -hmm. And I think I am right now at this point, the tortoise. I can keep doing it, but I'll be slow. Yeah, I think that fits. So I'll go with that. Wise. Yeah. Slow, but sure. (laughs) Sure. Uh, You can have a hardened shell when you need. Yep, it's true. Maybe maybe that is it. Yep. I love it. Uh, what's uh, What's your endurance superpower? Oh, wow. That's really interesting. It's a newly found one, but I do think I'm getting really good at remembering that um, I'm I'm slowly but surely getting good at remembering that pain is temporary, hmm. generally speaking. There, there's definitely a place where you can p- cross over into permanence, mm-hmm. but... Like when a bone's sticking out? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but in terms of like endurance, um, oh man, I'm super sore or my butt really hurts or my back is sore from lifting this bike up all day. It's like, yeah, but in a month I'll be back to normal. And no matter how how hard I push it right now, as long as I don't permanently injure myself by doing something stupid, I'm slowly and I'm surprised, but I'm, I am starting to build that, that resilience up a little bit. Yeah. But I don't even know if I have an endurance superpower yet. Yeah. If I had to pick one, that might be it. Uh, I can give you one. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) What? That I noticed on our trips, yeah. uh, your ability to be calm, cool, and collected, even when um, we're just grinding and grinding and grinding, you're kind of like neutral. See, this is where like, yeah, you're you're way more right than I am now hearing you say that. I would have never thought to say that, but you're right. Yeah. And actually that is something I've had for a long time in different situations. And yeah, you're, you're absolutely more accurate than I was. Yeah. Maybe that's something from backpacking where you had these kind of like... You, you, you're very level-headed where I get kind of dramatic in certain scenarios. I'll push through stuff, but I'll be like real dramatic about it. Interesting. You're, you're like very, you're just like, it's the same as it was yesterday or no, whatever. you're like totally An right. hour ago. Like, 
very commendable. Yeah. I'll change my answer to yours. Okay. Well, I just had to. No, you're Since right. you asked for it, I had to put you up. <laughs> I had to assign one to you. Uh, what's your worst fall or crash that you've ever had? Oh, man. This is embarrassing. Um, I haven't had a lot of bad falls, like backpacking or anything. Yeah. Um, I, okay, well, there's sort of two answers. When I was a kid, I actually had a really terrible rollerblading accident. Back when rollerblades were a thing. Yeah. And man, I like went way too fast down this hill and I fell. I actually had a, luckily a bike helmet on. I actually cracked a piece of, like a chunk of it came out. Oh my God. It was really, the doctor said by easily that like saved my life. Jeez. Um, and my hip, I, I fell so hard on the asphalt on my hip. It was like down to like the, some of the fat layers and I had to put, I think it's called Silvadine on it for a while to regrow the skin. Whoa. It was pretty gnarly. How old were you? Teenager. You see you're pretty like Wolverine regenerative at that point. So that's the thing in more recent years, it was hilarious. I get like an enduro bike, start riding that and do pretty well with it. Yeah. And I got that hardtail and by far my worst crash on the bike was on my commute to work. Okay. Super cold one morning. I had a heavy backpack on full of a bunch of stuff. Super like stiff because it was so cold. And I went down this section of trail and it was super loose and I lost my front wheel and I landed so hard on my knee. Ugh. I couldn't ride my bike for like three months. It hurt so bad. It was, I have a pretty high pain tolerance. Yeah. And I thought for a minute, like, I wonder if I need to like call an ambulance or something. Cause I'm like on the verge of losing it with how bad my knee hurt after that. Dang. It hurt really bad. It just must have hit perfectly the wrong way. And just on a commute? Just like oh, not riding into an urban enduro trail. bike. Yeah. Yep. Wild. Yep. Yeah, that's usually where it happens though, you know, when you're not paying attention. I also was not in the zone. Hadn't really drank coffee or anything yet. Like right. super cold. Yep. Yeah. Sucked. Wild. Uh who in, who in, this is kind of a broad question, but who inspires you? That's a great question. Um, oh man, that's a really good question. I've actually been, I, I think it's important to say from a high level perspective, I've been inspired by the whole ultra running community for a while now through my work at Catula, like starting to be exposed to some of those things, you know, you don't get exposed to a lot of that as a backpacker normally. Right. And with Cthulhu getting involved with some ultra athletes and me starting to pay more attention to that, it's been like super inspiring seeing what people are capable of. That yeah. is like really impressive. Uh, honestly, you've been a bit of an inspiration for me. Um, you know, we've, we've had a chance to talk a lot on personal level and just seeing your whole journey to be where you're at now and some of the stuff you're doing, dude, yeah. that's super inspiring for me. Um, yeah. And then in business, there's been some people, um, that I think have been just really cool in terms of different ways of, of thinking about the world and what we can do. Um, honestly, like Yvonne Chouinard is a really cool, inspirational person. I mean, people have all sorts of different opinions on Patagonia, but I think regardless, the way that that business inspired so many other ways of thinking about using business for a force of good. Um, I mean, it inspired Danny as part of w how he started Cthulhu. It's really inspired me. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, those are like kind of some that come to mind. But I think a lot of my inspiration these days comes through a lot of small things I see from a lot of different people, like little things I pick out from people that I'm just like, Oh man, I really appreciate this about this person. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. What's your favorite podcast? Uh, my favorite podcast is probably how I built this with Guy Raz. Okay. Um, I love hearing about entrepreneurship and how people are thinking differently. And that podcast has been super, super cool. Like he, he gets all sorts of interesting people on there talking about how they built their businesses and the challenges and failures and everything that they've experienced. And I, I've had a lot of fun listening to that. Do you like scroll that stuff away and apply it 
at Katula? I try to, yeah, I'd, I'd say I do. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. it kind of makes its way in yeah. to your, evolves your, your process. For sure. There. Yeah. I haven't heard that one. I'll have to. Yeah. Pick one, like scroll through it. You'll quickly find a company you've heard of and you'll get to hear the whole story. It's cool. I love that stuff. Yeah. That stuff is cool. I highly recommend the one for a start with Herb Kelleher. He, he founded Southwest Airlines. Okay. Guy was a hoot. Okay. Oh yeah. Cool. Yeah. Some, yeah. Some of those visionary people, uh, that, that they have some very interesting stories. You'll love that yeah. one. I think. All right. I'll check it out. Uh, what's the worst water source you've ever drank from? <laughs> oh, oh, oh man. Um, Oh man, what a good question. It's funny. It it may not be as bad as you might think because it's probably just been some little pool of stagnant water in some side canyon in the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it's not like something that has been like cow poop infested type of water. Uh, again, I think I've like uh worked really hard to avoid that mm -hmm. from my learning from other people. But yeah, I've Definitely filtered some dodgy water in the Grand Canyon that's just been sitting for way too long. Yeah. Maybe not as bad as others, though. I've lucked out. Sandy, though, yeah. Like, it's pretty... Yeah. We've uh, definitely done things where we've had to let it sit in, like, a vessel and let sediment fall and before we filter it. Yeah. Because Colorado River is pretty thick, right, with sediment. For sure. Difficult for filters. Yep. And then lastly, uh, what's one piece of advice you would give for new endurance athletes? Oh, I like that question a lot because I kind of put myself in that bucket right now. Yeah. And um, I honestly think a lot of it is stay open-minded to trying new things, hearing about, you know, seeking out other pieces of advice, you know, learn from other people as much as you can. That has definitely helped me. Um, I can remember a non-endurance ride I did with you where we rode up, uh, I think, near Hot Shots up there. That was when I started to he I never even thought about how many calories an hour I should be taking in until you were telling me about it. Yeah. And if you wouldn't have told me about that, I don't know how long it would have been before I thought about it. And I'm glad that we did that ride that day and you, you were... You were telling me all about it while I was probably suffering riding up that hill. Yeah. And it it was such a cheat code for me, for sure. I was repeating stuff that Dana told me. Right. Like, in the same situation. So I guess maybe uh, almost what I'm getting at here is, I mean, I'm super introverted, but build a little community of people that you can share information with or learn from. Yeah. Um, I think that has really helped me. I, I have only been riding bikes for a few years. I'm actually relatively happy with where I am endurance wise in a relatively short amount of time, yeah. especially working a, a full-time job and having a plenty of responsibility. Um, yeah. The cheat code to get there of, of picking up, piggybacking on your experience and other people I've talked to is huge. For sure. Yeah. And that's part of the goal of this podcast is to is to put that information out there right yeah, I, really like I tried that. to do it a little bit with the seasoned bike packer but it was too consolidated i needed to go to the source of these these this, these pieces of information right in this access to information i think it's such a good idea <laughs> and then put it out on the internet you know and then people can learn and use it or not you know and like today i think you've said many many things probably to new bike packers or backpackers that um they haven't considered or haven't thought of or that they will leverage you know yeah um you've definitely taught me things too like i mean it's not just a one-way street yeah right you have a base knowledge that's way better at like fundamental stuff mm -hmm. uh than than i had with with backpacking um and um so that's that's what it's all about for me you know is is progression and progressing so it's great advice yeah. for anybody starting out new. So, um, yeah, so I guess we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Um, Thanks for having me as your second guest. I'm honored. Yeah. yeah really it's mean it's it. an yeah. honor to have you here. We're, I'm definitely going to have you back as um, you evolve the Catula products and as you evolve as a backpacker and bikepacker. Yeah. Um, maybe we can get a pack rafting trip in. Yeah, I haven't thought I haven't forgotten about that. Yeah, I'm or trying we can, to get this learning under my belt and then we're going to do something cool. Yeah. Um there's a couple, you know, like 
like a, a mixed hiking float trip sort of situations down some different areas. There's some cool like adventure stuff we can do. So um, I could even see some bike rafting in our future it's starting to pick up. I've seen that around. It seems pretty cool. It sounds really it's cool. It's like once you master or you think you've mastered one thing, let's like complicate it a little bit more, right? <laughs> or a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that like what we're seeking? That's yeah. That's what scratches our itch or whatever as adventures. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much for being on. Yeah. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, go look at Catula stuff. It's fantastic. Catula.com. Yep. Right. Is the website. You can find all the products. Um, they're an amazing company and, uh, straight from the source making innovative products. So thanks, Chris. Yeah. Thank you, Dylan. And, uh, yeah. Let's go get some food. Sounds good. All right. Cut. Cut. <laughs>